CDC or the US CDC or a variety of other sources, but they have stepped forward to say that if there are particular municipal, municipal or town issues that they can help with in terms of things that um, uh, town councils and city councils are considering, um, they can step up to do that. And so um, Councilor Ray and I were on a phone, a Zoom meeting earlier today. It was the first one of its kind and several items had been identified as kind of pilot issues that may be more deeply informed by staff at GPCOG doing a deeper dive in terms of recommendations or resources. And so I just wanted to shout out a thank you to them in this section of our agenda. Um, so many of the issues that we face in Portland um, are also being faced in South Portland and Westbrook and beyond. And so there was a really great representation folks from um, Scarborough and Falmouth and um, you know, several towns on the phone, uh, on the Zoom meeting this morning. So I just wanted to let you all as counselors know that if there's something that we're considering and we may wanna get additional input about that item, we can go um, straight to GPCOG and ask them. And I think they're gonna, um, they're gonna be responsive in that way. Um, so um, I wanted to thank GPCOG and let you all know that. And then the second thing is I just wanted to kind of alert folks and say it on the mic that I wanna um, thank the folks at USM um, who have committed to doing updates periodically which will go to all of us that will inform us about activities at the wellness center over at the USM gym and just kind of updates from the partners. Um, and so I wanted to thank them for including us in that and um, doing that work. I think it's once every two weeks, we're gonna get an update. Um, so that's it for me with announcements. I'm gonna look around again, just to see if anybody else has anything to say. And Councillor Chung. Um. I know there's lots of uh, really good relief funds out there. But I just wanted to remind the public about Creative Portland's Arts, Artist Relief Fund. Um, they're trying to raise money to, to support artists that make our city so unique and special. And I know that um, around this time, we all kind of look forward to First Fridays and obviously we can't do that, but the artists in Portland, um, not many of them don't qualify for a lot of the reliefs that are, um, provided to SBA uh, types of programs because they're independent contractors. But the Artist Relief Fund will raise money to, to help support our local artists. And the creative economy is one of the more important economies in Maine. Uh, they contribute $1.4 billion to Maine's economy and half of it comes from Portland alone. And so the artists help to, to generate a lot of the creative economy revenues for the city of Portland. So I just want the public to, to uh, kind of look to Creative Portland and check them out. And if you can, please donate to the Artist Relief Fund. Thank you, Councillor Chung. I see a hand up from Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. I just wondered if you could um, uh, tell the council and the public a little bit about how you and the manager are managing the agendas, just as far as what's coming up um, and not coming up right now during the COVID crisis. Um, I know I've received some questions of when things are coming up that were scheduled, say in March as a first read and that kind of thing. And I wondered if it might provide some clarity as why we're not taking up some of the items that um, we were right about to take up. Yep, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to weigh in a little bit and would love the city manager too as well. I think I, I, you you may be referring to the the leash issue and Baxter Woods. Um, no, no, not things. just that. No, I think there were other items like the marijuana ordinance and such that were also on first read. Um, so I just I thought there's a broader range of issues that uh, we've put off, and I I thought it might help to clarify both to the council and uh, to members of the public uh, what's mm -hmm. happening with our agendas. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how things have gone from where I stand. Um, being relatively new in the position, <laughs> admittedly, um, when we uh, postponed our March 16th meeting, um, that, that was a meeting that we were scheduled to have. We had a, an agenda ready to go, um, but we had a press conference on Friday the 13th and the world started changing um, for us. And so as I have been working with the council, the city manager, um, after that, I mean, it was kind of a day-to-day -day assessment of, should we have a second meeting in March? If so, what for? Everything is new. And so we did, as you recall, end up meeting on Monday, March 30th, which was a full two weeks after our regularly scheduled meeting. And at that time, we really focused the agenda on COVID-specific matters and um, chose to put 
other non-urgent things to the side. If something was urgent and required council action because of a third party agreement or funding, something like that, we, we would get it on the agenda. But we, we, we definitely postponed some items and you're gonna see a couple on the uh, agenda tonight um, that fall into that category. So from where I stand, we've been working strategically together and I know the city manager has with staff to figure out what are the most pressing items to get before the council on our agendas and manage those things so that we're respectful of people's time, um, both here on you know council meeting nights, but also how are we spending time in workshops and are we being as responsive as we need to be to the priorities of the day? That's the way that I see it is every day that I'm doing work, I'm thinking, what is the priority of the day? So city manager, would you mind weighing in on that? No, I would, uh, I would so, somewhat reiterate what uh, the mayor just mentioned. You know, this is all very new for all of us. You know, we are trying to balance um, uh, the day-to-day, -day, sometimes the hour-to-hour -hour situation that we're all dealing with with COVID-19. And what we have tried to do is bring forward a balanced agenda so we're not meeting until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, the, the point being is, is that COVID, normally this would not be a, uh, every meeting agenda topic, and we would be able to get a lot more done. But tonight, for instance, there are, I believe are several amendments um, to the uh, stay at home order. So that takes up an enormous amount of time. And I think we just have to balance what we're dealing with today with what we have to deal with with regular business. And just to clarify, by asking that, uh, I'm not at all disagreeing with how the uh, agendas are being managed. I, I completely uh, happy with the deferring to the manager and, and the mayor on that. I just thought it was important uh, to sort of get that out there. Um, I know that the mayor had expressed uh, that approach to me and uh, I'm completely comfortable with it, but I thought it was important for the public to hear. And I wasn't sure if all members of the council uh, uh, were aware as well. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to just uh, air that out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. And if any um, individual councillors wanna have a phone call to discuss anything or even talk about What's upcoming, um, always, don't hesitate to call me. Um, Councillor Mavadonis. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and really not an announcement, just a question, and I don't know if now's the uh, time or if it'll be later in the agenda or um, at a later date. I was just curious if the manager um, had any update or you had any update on the status at the Expo and at Oxford Street. Um, I know our staff has been uh, working very diligently, but also very short-staffed and didn't know if there were any updates on, on anything COVID-related uh, there. Um, like I said, it could be now or later in the agenda or, or uh, I guess, at a later time. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll look to the city manager. Do you, do you want to answer that question now? I think, I think now might be the time, given that we don't have anything specific to that on the agenda. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor, for asking that question, because I think it's really important for the public to know what a great job our staff continues to do at uh, operating multiple shelters. Um, as uh, I think all of you know, over the weekend, the state CDC began to do um, testing in all of the homeless facilities. Um, and I'm happy to say that of all of the folks that were at the Oxford Street Shelter, on Saturday, we had no positive tests. And I think that that goes to the heart of the fact that we had a very good plan from the beginning. Um, and I think that staff continues to do a fantastic job of making sure that we're, we are separating. Uh, we are doing, um, as all of you know, we have the Oxford Street Shelter operational. We are uh, using the family shelters, family shelter buildings um, to isolate anyone who has tested positive. We have several individuals and families in motels, which continue to provide need assistance. And then of course the expo. So there's more testing that needs to be done, but um, so far so good uh, in the city run operations. And thanks for asking that question. Thank you, Councillor Mavadonis. Um, Councillor Ray. So just to add to that, um, tomorrow night, we do have our first online health and human services and public safety meeting, and we will be getting COVID-19 updates from four city departments, the emergency 
Management Coordinator, Katie Hager. We'll be hearing from Fire Chief Petro. We'll be hearing from um, Police Chief Clark. And we'll be hearing from Kristen Dow of HHS. So if people want to hear more of what is happening with, with um, in relation to COVID-19 with those departments, we are, we are getting more information tomorrow night, 5.30, um, Zoom. Great, thank you. Um, seeing no additional announcements, we will move on to approval of the um, previous meeting's minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes from April 14th? So moved. Councilor Ray? Second. Second. Second by Councilor Chong. Um, is, there any council, uh, is there any council comment? Seeing none, um, this every every vote is a roll call vote, and will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavadonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau. Yes. Councilor Chong. Yes. Yes, Snyder. Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Moving on to proclamations. Um, will the clerk please read the proclamation? Proclamation 11, recognizing April as Genocide Awareness Month, sponsored by Mayor Kate Snyder. Thank you. And I would love to turn this over to Councillor Chong and ask him to read the proclamation this evening as he um, helped to get this on our agenda tonight. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Corporation Council, um, uh, Mandy Levine, city staff, and also uh, Marfine Chan for, for tightening up the language and bringing this forward. Marfine Chan works for the Human Rights, uh, Holocaust and Human Rights uh, Center of Maine. And so the proclamation reads as recognizing equal as a genocide awareness month, whereas the term genocide is coined by Raphael Lemkin in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust and defined in the United States, uh, United Nations 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide to describe the systematic destruction in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And whereas the month of April commemorates the Armenian Genocide 1915 to 22, the Holocaust 1933 to 1945, the Cambodian Genocide, 1975 to 1979, the Siege of Sarajevo in Bosnia, 1992, the Rwandan Genocide, 1994, and the Darfur Genocide, 2003. And whereas the prevention of genocide requires vigilance and a commitment to remembrance and education, and whereas the city of Portland, Maine, believes in the dignity and worth of every human being, regardless of the individual's race, color, religion, age, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, ancestry or national origin, physical or mental disability, veteran status, genetic information, or any other protected group status as defined by applicable law. And whereas the city of Portland will continue to be a welcoming city for all persons, providing city services and programs to all individuals and recognize that everyone has the right to live their lives with dignity, free from fear and persecution based on their race, faith, national origin, or immigration status. I therefore be it resolved that I, Kathleen M. Snyder, uh, <laughs> okay. City of Portland, a uh, surrogate, uh, and members of the City Council hereby recognize the month of April of each year as Genocide Awareness Month and therefore be further resolved that the city of Portland encourages and supports the Office of Economic Opportunity and the Portland Public Schools Multilingual and Multicultural Center in their efforts to facilitate the collaboration with ethnic and community-based organizations and the state and local partners, the citywide recognition of Genocide Awareness Month. Signed and sealed this day, 27th day of April, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chong, for reading that. And again, for your help behind the scenes to make sure that we get that ready. If we were in person with one another, we'd be walking over to shake hands with Marfine, Chan, and potentially others. Um, 
and handing them a copy of the proclamation. I'll make sure that those get out to folks who would like to have a copy. So thank you very much. Okay, moving on in the agenda, we've got um, uh, consent items is next. Will the clerk please read order 163? Order 163, setting time for opening of polls on July 14th, 2020, regarding state and local elections, sponsored by Catherine Jones, city clerk. Thank you very much. And is there any city manager comment? Not on this item. Is there any public comment on this item? Okay. I know Jessica's help, helping me keep an eye out here. I don't see any um, public comment on this item. Um, sorry? Oh, I thought I just right. heard I was just saying I don't see anyone with their hand okay. raised either. Great. Okay, so we'll close public comment on that item and I'll look for a motion. Move Ooh. passage. Move passage. Councilor Ray. Second. Second by Councilor Cook. Thank you. Um, uh, and this is for everything on the consent uh, calendar, which is just one item. Is there any council comment on this item? Seeing none, I will ask for the vote to be called. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavidonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau. Yes. Councilor Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Uh, thank you to the city clerk for that one. And we'll move into licenses. Will the clerk please read order 164? Order 164, approving municipal offices approval of BIPA, Brigida, LLC, DBA, Radici. Application for a class one FSC with outdoor dining on public property at 50 Washington Avenue. Sponsored by John P. Jennings, city manager. Thank you. And is there any city manager comment on this item? Nope, we'll go straight into public comment here. Um, and, I, and I won't know if the um, owners of Radici are here with us this evening, unless you let me, oh, maybe, we, maybe we do have somebody. Um, so I'm, uh, it looks like I'm gonna unmute. Like I'm gonna un oh, Hi, I'm gonna we're here. Hi. Thanks for including us on this agenda. We really appreciate it. Could you tell us your name and address and are you indeed the owners of the restaurant? We are, my name is Alexandra Forrester. Um, our home address is in Freeport 25 Harvest Ridge Road and the restaurant will be on Washington Avenue. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's <laughs> a weird experience not to be able to see you, but um, I know that we all appreciate you dialing in and being with us this evening. Um, and when we get into the motion itself, I'll ask if there's any questions for you, but otherwise just thank you so much for being here. Thank you, we appreciate it. And is there, uh, is there any other public comment on this item? Um, seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councilor, Bay, Councilor Costa with a second. Is there any council comment or questions for the owner on this item? Great. Seeing none, um, I'll ask the clerk to please call for the vote. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavidonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Um, and thank you again to the owners for being here with us this evening. Thank you for doing business in Portland. Um, okay, will the clerk please read Order 165? Order 165, approving El Luchador Holdings LLC DBA Terra Lingua. Application for a class one FSC with outdoor dining on private property at 40 Washington Avenue, sponsored by John P. Jennings, city manager. Thank you. And is there any public comment on this item? And if we have the owners with us this evening, we'd love to say hello to you. If not, that's okay. Um, I do see, I do see a hand up. Um, Melanie. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Melanie, or this is Pliny Reynolds and Melanie Reynolds. We are the owners of Terlingua, and we're excited to move down the street into the former Silly's 
space. And uh, yeah, thanks for having this meeting. This well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. This is an exciting move for you all. Um, and uh, again, I wish we could see you in person, but thanks again for being here. Thank, thank you. you guys. Is there any other public comment on this item? Um, okay, uh, seeing none, is there a motion? Move passage. Second. Councilor Ray. Second. Second by Councilor Cook. Is there any council comment? It's hard to let this go by without uh, mentioning how much I enjoy their menu, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll have more space to enjoy their menu. We all will. Any other council comment? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll look to the clerk to call the vote. Council Dusan. Yes. Council Mavadonis. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Council Ali. Yes. Council Costa. Yes. Council Ray. Yes. Council Thibodeau. Yes. Council Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Thank you, and again, thank you to, uh, I think it's the Reynolds for being with us this evening. Um, will the clerk please read order 166? Order 166, approving Definitive Brewing Company, LLC, DBA, Definitive Brewing Company. Application for a Class A lounge with indoor entertainment and outdoor dining on private property at 35 Industrial Way. Sponsored by John P. Jennings, City Manager. Thank you, and is there any public comment on this? item this evening. Uh, Michael? Hi, this is uh, Michael Rankin. I think I maybe raised my hand slightly too quickly, but I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Definitive Brewing. And thank you for having us here. Nope, your timing is perfect. I just wanted to know that you were here with us and thank you so much um, for being here and for doing business in Portland. I don't see any other public comment on this item? And so I'm going to look to uh, the council for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councillor Cook, I've got a second with Councillor Ray, I believe. Did I get that right? Sure. Okay. Is there any council comment? I see Councillor Ray. You're muted. Let's say, did that backwards. Um, I would like to make sure that we condition this license. And I had a question about that for, I see Jessica Hanscom's here. So um, my question is, I know that the applicant uh, requested beer and wine and cider. So I was gonna do beer and wine. What does cider fall under? It's not listed on the license, I don't think. Cider falls under beer. It does, okay. Thank you very much. So then I will just like, do I need to um, amend the motion? No, there's only three types of, um, you can either have malt, which is beer, vinous, which is wine, or um, spirits, which is hard liquor. So if it falls under one of those categories, you're fine. Great, thank you. So then cool. my, question, my question for Corporation Council is, do I need to amend the motion or can I just state the condition? What's the condition? The condition is that they can only sell beer and wine. This is another instance of um, applying for the Class A lounge, but not having a desire to sell the spirits. And we don't, we don't want to license them as a full bar. We want to license them just for food and wine. So do I need to move an amendment? Um, Councilor Ray, I'm trying to pull up. I'm having some issues with my okay. computer. I'm trying to pull up um, the order. Jessica Hanscom, um, what was the? Uh, how did how did you put the the application together? Was it just f with the condition on it? Uh, the condition was listed in the description. Um, okay. So the description states. Uh, application was filed on 4-3-2020, New City and State Applications. The applicant currently holds a brewery license. The applicant is requested and the City Council may condition the license to only allow for the sale of beer and wine per 28A MRSA section 10111A. So my order didn't say it, the description said it. Uh, the order the order actually says it on it, um, Council Ray, so you don't need to condition it. Okay. Wonderful. And then all set. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Cook. 
Thank you. I also just wanted to congratulate Definitive Brewing. They've won some recent awards and I just uh, had written to them to say congratulations and wanted to acknowledge that uh, here tonight as well. Thank you. Is there any other council comment on this item? Um, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All right. Kathy, I think you're muted. Yes. Okay. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavidonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau. Yes. Councilor Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Those licenses all passed unanimously, and we will head into uh, resolutions. Um, so, uh, will the clerk please read Mayor, resolution? Mayor, 11? it is six o'clock. Oh, you're right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I always think about that ahead of time, and then we get rolling. Um, so, we will pause the regular agenda at this point in time and take public comment on items that are not on this evening's agenda. So if you've got something to um, talk with us about, um, again, that is not on this evening's agenda, um, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. And when we call on you, you'll have um, three minutes. And would you start out by saying your name and address, please? Okay. We've got a couple here, so I'll start at the top. I've And I pardon me, sometimes I see your name, sometimes I see your phone number, um, and sometimes I only see part of your name. So I'm gonna do my best to just call on folks. Um, sorry about being so informal, but Austin. Hi, good evening. I, I may be jumping in too early. Uh, my comment has to do with uh, the activity around the Community Development Block Grant. Is that- Yeah, the yep. there will be a public hearing on that item a little bit later in the agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will next go to Stephen Scharf. Stephen Scharf, uh, uh, Cumberland Avenue in Portland. Um, you uh, referenced at the beginning of the meeting uh, items that are not coming up on your agenda, et cetera. One uh, specific item that seems to be uh, not coming up in total is the Portland city budget, the city side of the budget. And I'm concerned uh, that it's uh, not been uh, uh, released to the public. Uh, and it's normal uh, course of business, and that there seems to be no effort to push that along to have a budget for beginning July 1st, 2020, uh, and just would like to get an update as to where that's going and why it's uh, uh, being uh, uh, held off uh, for now, so thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, as a quick response to that, I'm just going to look to Councillor Mavadonis, the finance chair. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this is uh, not unique. Uh, a lot of people are having this question. Do you mind weighing in a little bit, Councillor Mavadonis? Uh, by all means, Mayor. Um, we have a finance committee meeting scheduled for May 14th. Um, uh, there will be uh, a portion of the meeting uh, dedicated to talking about uh, talking with the school department. Um, and about their budget uh, in the latter part of the meeting. Um, once this pandemic started, uh, we made a decision that um, we really could not do much with the, the city budget um, until we had a better sense of where we were financially. Uh, in May, we will at least have the entire month of April uh, under our belts and we'll have a, a better idea of our current financial picture. And hopefully, we'll have. Uh, some more information. Um, I'm not sure how much in terms of uh, revenues for the upcoming fiscal year, at least projections. We know that uh, in there's a variety of articles, whether they're on a national basis or uh, a statewide basis. Um, there was one in the Press Herald today. Um, and uh, I anticipate that we will not uh, have a new budget in place by July 1st. The legislature took action to allow towns and municipalities in, um, and, and the school departments to, to the extent that they're uh, permitted to um, continue on with their existing fiscal year's budget um, because of the uncertainties around uh, 
FY21. Um, so uh, we wanna have a budget as early as we can, but we really can't, uh, staff can't put it together and we really can't debate it until we um, have a better sense of what our revenues will be for the upcoming year. Uh, hopefully that's helpful, but the 14th will be our, uh, our meeting, which we've postponed everything uh, to the 14th. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that. Um, okay, and that um, we'll go back to public comment on items that are not on this evening's agenda. And we've got our hand raised by Hanover Street. Uh, yes, uh, George Rowe, um, 28 Hanover Street. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a request. I think the council has done a good job of posting uh, Zoom meetings to the town hall streams, um, and I appreciate the transparency. For some reason, the Economic Development Committee meeting from early last week has not been uploaded, and I have no idea if Councillor Costa has a reason for why that hasn't happened, but uh, it would be great for us to have that available like the rest of the committee meetings. Um, I have a a quick uh, question about um, with respect to the budget, there are a lot of discretionary spending items that we should be thinking about pausing because we may need that money literally for municipal survival in the coming months. And so I have not heard anything about suspending uh, non-essential projects. I'm thinking mostly of the amethyst lot parking lot that is being um, supposed to be turned into a park over the next few months. Um, it would be nice to have a shiny new little waterfront spot, but not if it means that there are lots of laid off people uh, who would, you know, basically be resulting in that money being spent for something that is not essential at this time. So that's the kind of thing that I hopefully you're all thinking about behind the scenes and we'll be communicating to the public some of those difficult choices. I'm also a little bit concerned about um, land use. Uh, the Land Bank Commission had a meeting last week that the mayor attended and there was talk about removing homeless encampments and nobody seemed to have any problem with the problem that this may not be the best time to be going into some of the more neglected parts of our city and removing homeless encampments. Uh, there's no clear process for how these encampments are being uh, deemed abandoned. And I think that uh, those of us who have homes, who are lucky to have homes right now, are definitely uh, having difficulty adjusting to this pandemic. Imagine if you don't have a home and uh, you have to rely on some awful makeshift campsite and the fact that our city is using resources as we speak, including parks department uh, personnel to remove these campsites during a pandemic seems like a, to put it, you know, bluntly insensitive use of our, res of our limited resources. And uh, I was sort of surprised that the mayor didn't seem to have any misgivings about that. So hopefully we'll have more information about that. Um, on land use, the planning department seems to be pushing a number of projects, um, including- Mr. Rowe. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for being here. Um, okay, uh, this next one is, um, it looks like- uh, Mayor, Bailey. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if I could just chime in quickly as the okay. economic development chair. Um, I know that the manager and Greg Mitchell, the economic development director, are both uh, here at the meeting. So um, if something hasn't been posted, we'll certainly follow up and make sure that that gets posted um, as soon as can be. Uh, this was the first meeting and uh, members of the council are aware, but maybe not every member of the public. Um, each meeting is often being run by different uh, people each time that we go through and set it up based on the subject matter expertise. So if there was an oversight, we'll make sure that it's addressed. Thank you. Thank you. And just to clarify for folks, I was at that Land Banks Commission uh, meeting. We got some updates from some park staff. We were informed that the um, campsites had been abandoned and that they were using existing parks employees to do some work um, 
to do some cleaning up. It wasn't, it wasn't on the agenda. So just clarifying that. Um, I will go to, I think it's Patricia Bailey. Hi, Pat Bailey, I'm chair of the Land Bank Commission. Oh, there you are, Pat. okay, thanks. I, I just wanted to reiterate the same point that the mayor made. This was um, a request brought, brought up by the park to mark, Department to remove debris, uh, abandoned sites. We are not displacing any homeless people in it. that all people have reasonable housing, um, especially during a national emergency. That's all I have to add. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I'm looking for any other comments um, from folks on items that are not on this evening's agenda. I don't see any. Councilor Costa, I see your hand up, but I think it's a lingering one. Nope, okay, that's gone. looked at the order again and I was mistaken. I thought um, I looked at the application and it had checked that box, but the order doesn't include that condition. So I just need someone to um, reconsider. Move to reconsider. Second. Okay. Second. All right. So we are considering order 166. So I move that we condition this license to include only beer and wine. We need to vote on the reconsideration. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take that back. So so this would be an amendment to order 166 to um, condition first, it for First, uh, wine first the clerk needs to uh, take the roll for the reconsideration vote and then we'll, okay. then we'll have it back in front of us and um, Councilor Ray can move to add the condition. Thank you. Was it Councilor Mavadonis with a second by Councilor Ray? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the clerk will call the vote on that reconsideration. Um, Council Dusan. Yes. Council Mavadonis. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? Yes. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. All right, and now I move that we add the condition to only include beer and wine in this license. Second. Second. Um, I think that was Councilor Chong with the second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Cook, doing my best here. Um, <laughs> are there any co uh, council comments or questions on this amendment? Is it a, considered an amendment? Amendment to the order? Yes, yes correct. correct. Okay. Um, seeing no questions, um, I think we can go straight to a vote on this one, yes. right? Yes, vote on the amendment and then vote on the order as amended. Okay. So we'll take a vote on the amendment, please. Councilor Dusan. 
Yes. Councilor Mavidonis? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? Yes. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay, now we're back to the um, main order 166 as amended. And I'll ask if there's any, um, uh, should we, do we go to public comment on this? I don't think we need to at this point, do we? we are, you already did, so you, you already can did just it. go right Okay, now. any council comment or questions? Seeing none, we will go to a vote on order 166 as amended. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavidonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? Yes. Council Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Okie doke. Thank you. Thank you for catching that, um, Councilor. I mean, cor Corporate, yeah. I mean, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for uh, indulging me. <laughs> Okay, so we are we are finished with public comment on non agenda items and we are back to our um, our agenda and will the clerk please read resolution 11. Resolution 11, calling on the legislature to pass LD 433, the main equal rights amendment sponsored by Mayor Kate Snyder. Um, yes, it is. And I'll just give a little bit of background here um, without reading the full resolution. I just wanted folks to know this is something that came up quite a while ago. It was scheduled for our March 16th meeting. So we pushed this off. Um, but I was given reason to believe that making its way through the council um, would be helpful um, at the state level. And so when I was up in Augusta on February 25th, I ran into Representative Lois Galgay Rickett, um, who is uh, a representative from South Portland representing Maine's House District 31. And she shared with me the efforts that she's making with towns and cities across the state to encourage the Maine legislature to pass the Maine Equal Rights Amendment. If this is approved this evening, it will be shared with the state legislature and will express our support for LD 433. So I, um, I urge your support this evening. I think that it's important. Um, I brought it forward both because I think that um, uh, it's important to respond to legislators who are looking to um, make progress on these kinds of issues up at the state house, but also because um, I just think it's an important action to take um, here in Portland as we show support for this kind of work, which is long overdue. Um, is there, so that, that's my comment on that. Um, is there any public comment on this item? Okay, looks like we've got Hannah, uh, uh, George Rowe. Uh, yes, I think this is a great uh, effort. Um, a little historical fact, people may not know this, but the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic uh, actually put some big wind in the sails of the movement for women to vote in this country. Um, it was quite clear that one of the reasons the country made it through that crisis was the work of many, many women, obviously, taking care of people, uh, many, many sick and dying people. And that changed the minds of a lot of people who were here, you know, previously uh, hesitant or uh, ambivalent. And so, I think that an equal rights amendment uh, should have happened a long time ago in this country, but if Portland can continue to focus attention on why this is needed even today, um, I think we all know how many women are on the front lines of this current pandemic. So I appreciate this effort, even though some people may view it as a bit of a token gesture, but um, I hope this isn't, this is the beginning of the council's work on this. Uh, in public or behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on this item? Okay, um, seeing none, I'll look for a motion. I'd like to make a motion. Um, and is there a second? Second. Councilor Dusan. And is there any council comment? Uh, Councilor Cook. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the mayor for bringing this forward and note that I wish I had worn my white scarf. I know. <laughs> thank you. Any other council comment? Councilor Ray. 
I too wish I'd worn my red white scarf. I'm tempted to run upstairs and get it. That's you know, it's so close when we're having these home meetings. Um, but thank you, Madam Mayor, for bringing this forward. I also appreciate it. Well, I, I Councilor Dusan. Well, I guess it seems that the whole uh, women caucus should speak in support. So thank you very much for bringing this forward and um, and uh, please pass on to Representative Rickett the thanks of our council for her persistence on this. I will, I will, thank you, thank you all. Um, any other council comment this evening? Um, seeing none, we will go to a vote. So do some. Yes. Council Mavadonis? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Council Ali? Yes. Council Costa? Yes. Council Ray? Yes. Council Thibodeau? Yes. Council Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Thank you all. I will communicate with um, uh, Representative Rickett later tonight to let her know that we, um, that we approved this this evening and I will be proud for her to carry it up to the legislature for us. So thank you so much. Uh, will the clerk please read resolution 12. Resolution 12, adopting the fiscal year 2021 annual action plan, including appropriations for community development block grant program, the home program and emergency solution grant program and certifications pertaining thereto. Sponsored by John P. Jennings, city manager. Thank you so much. And just as a reminder, both to the council and the public, that this is the first of two public hearings on this item. Um, we won't be taking action tonight. We won't be taking council comments and questions tonight, but we will be looking to the manager to frame up um, this resolution and then we will go out for the public hearing. Mayor, I, I defer to Councillor Chong. I need to recuse myself uh, because um, for a year, I, I cannot comment on any CDBG uh, appropriations or, or discussion because my agencies have received uh, grants from CDBG in the past. So um, can someone just text me when I need to come back? So <laughs> sure. <laughs> turn off the video. I won't know when you guys are gonna be on or not. All right, we will send you a text. Thank you, Councilor Chong. Uh, I've also got a hand from Councilor Dusan before we go to the city manager. I'm sorry, I just forgot to take my hand down. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so we're back to you, um, city manager. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, as everyone knows, this is the annual um, process that the city goes through to allocate CD CDBG funds and to allocate um, home funds. Um, this is uh, always the, one of the most uh, difficult decisions to make uh, because there are so many worthy organizations who apply for these funds uh, and it's always very very difficult to make those decisions but i do want to thank the cdbg allocation committee they do excellent work every year i'm very very happy to work with them i met with them on multiple occasions during this past process um, I did, however, want to make some changes um, to their recommendations, which is what you have before you now um, for action. Um, I do believe that it's important to, in the future, to begin to look at other organizations to fund um, and not have, I've been told that HUD does appreciate the fact that you have a differing group of organizations re receive funding and since I've been in this position for the last five years, many of the same organizations continue to be funded. And so it is my hope that in the future, in the very near future, that we can begin to get other organizations funded uh, for their projects. Hence the reason why in my recommendations, you'll see that I reached down to grab a couple of new organizations uh, in order to help fund with some of the critical plans and programs that they have before them. At this time, I wanted to give Mary Davis an opportunity to do a, uh, a short presentation on the CDBG and, and on, the, on the process itself and the recommendations. Thank you for being with us, Mary. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary Davis. I'm the Housing and Community Development Division Director for the city. 
Um, as the city manager mentioned, this is an annual process that we go through um, to allocate funding that the city receives from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, there's three main uh, programs that we receive funding for, the Community Development Block Grant or the CDBG program, the Home Program and the Emergency Solutions Grant or ESG program. Um, the, the funding recommendations um, from staff and the CDBG Allocation Committee and the city manager are all in the council backup packet. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Kelly Walsh from um, the Housing Community Development Office. She manages the CDBG program and she managed the um, CDBG allocation committee process throughout this past year. Um, the committee meets um, beginning in December, right through to um, the beginning of March and reviews every CDBG application that is received um, and makes um, very educated recommendations on um, how the funding should be allocated. Um, and in re that regard, I wanted to um, give uh, Matt Purrington, who's the chair of the um, allocation committee, an opportunity to give a brief um, overview of the committee's work. Thanks, Mary. Um, and I Aaron Jennings and the rest of the city council for the opportunity. My name is Matt Purrington. I'm the chair of the uh, City of Portland Community uh, Development Block Grant Committee for the fiscal year 2020-2021. And I do want to just take a moment and introduce the uh, uh, members, other members of the committee. Kelly Young, our vice chair, Lucinda Pine, who is the chair, Samuel Martin, Leslie Clegg, Edward Loro, Stephen Hoodlett, Lawson Condry, and Brad Hanscom. Uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, thank you to the city council for their commit, continued commitment to the CDBG program of the citizen-led committee in scoring the applications and making the recommendations to the city manager and the city council. Uh, we also, as a committee, want to thank the 22 development and 16 social service applicants. We're aware of how dependent your organizations and your initiatives are on the funding to maximize your positive impact on the community. And we recognize the significant commitment of effort and resources that the application process uh, demands. As uh, City Manager Jennings said, as is the case every year, there's far more worthy projects and organizations than CDBG funding can support. This year requests exceeded the available one. Particularly Matt? acute given the ongoing and resulting case. I'm so, sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You you froze up a little bit as you were talking about the the, the amount of requests. Could you just go back a sentence or two? I sure can. And maybe um, my internet is a little unstable, so maybe I will stop the video if you wouldn't mind. Um, that might help. That's fine. Thank you. Sure. We just want to make sure you're we're hearing everything you have to say. I appreciate it. So I, I mentioned that the, this year the requests um, for funding ratio of about two to one. Um, I mentioned this funding challenge is particularly acute given the ongoing pandemic and the resulting social and economic hardship. Uh, the importance of the support and services that the applicant organizations provide has never been more apparent for the committee, it was a privilege to consider these applications and to learn more about the amazing and essential work that these organizations do to serve, strengthen, and enrich our community. Um, we believe that the development applications recommended for funding represent a favorable balance of priorities. Uh, this includes increasing available housing, fostering environmental sustainability, increasing access, eliminating blight, and creating opportunities for economic development. We believe the social services recommendations reflect a diverse approach 
to addressing the range of community needs reflected by the applications. Of note, the committee recommendations generally favored applications addressing specific performance and outcome data, a recognition of societal trends, complementary versus competing programs, and the demand for services from different constituencies throughout Portland. Uh, in particular, the committee focused on applications that foster partnerships among organizations to maximize the impact and efficiency of the programs. We observed that partnerships and cooperation reduce the duplication and redundancy in services and can more likely maximize the impact of the limited funding available. Uh, in addition, the committee believes organizations working together are more likely to launch successful, effective, and sustainable programs. In making the final recommendations, the committee focused on the scoring criteria and the information provided in each application in order to be fair to all the applicants. As always, the committee will continue to look at ways to improve the efficiency, effectiveness, and ensure the transparency of the program. Um, given that next year represents the beginning of a new five-year CDBG cycle, we've taken special care to pass along ideas and recommendations to the recently established priority task force to continue improvement in the application assessment and scoring process. We welcome comments, suggestions, and feedback from both the city council as well as the public. We recognize that it's impossible to satisfy everyone with the specific funding recommendations in any given year. And we hope the city manager, city council, and community are satisfied with the approach, the goals, the integrity, and the commitment of the allocation committee. Thanks again for the opportunity. Um, we really appreciate considering these applications um, and considering our recommendations for funding. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Matt, and thank you for your work leading this, um, this effort for all of us. We really appreci appreciate your being here tonight. Um, Mary, do you, have, do you have more? No, that's it. Um, we could go right into public comment if you're ready. Okay, I'll just look to the city manager one last time before we go to public hearing. Yes, Mayor, um, I did want to also um, offer my appreciation to both Mary and Kelly they did do a, a fantastic job, uh, especially Kelly managing the entire process. However, I did want to ask Mary, because the council will be hearing about a supplemental um, CDBG uh, and actually the housing committee dealt with this a bit last week. So I just wanted um, all of you in the public to hear the difference between what you're um, listening to and the, and the public can comment on tonight and the supplemental CDBG funding uh, that will be coming down the road shortly. So Mary, uh, do you mind? Sure. Um, I just wanted to pull up the numbers for that supplemental funding so that they get them right. Um, through the uh, CARES Act passed by um, the federal government, um, there was money uh, awarded to both the CDBG program and the ESG program, the Emergency Solutions Program. Um, there are several funding cycles for each that will be made available through the CARES Act, but the first of three funding cycles is um, made through the regular formulas used to allocate uh, funding to communities through CDBG and ESG. Um, so for the city of Portland, we will have supplemental CDBG funding um, in addition to the um, amount that's in your packet tonight of $1,137,154. And through the ESG program, the city will receive an additional $573,734. Um, you will be um, receiving a set of recommendations um, from the city manager in May. Um, there are several procedural things that we have to go through um, to uh, make use of this money and amend um, existing plans with HUD to allow for us to use the money. Um, and all of those things will come up on your um, May agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And if that is all from the city manager, um, and again, thank you, Mary, for being with us. Thank you, Matt, for being with us and Kelly too. We will go to a public hearing. Although wait, I've got a hand up by Councillor Cook. Councillor Mayor, Cook. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions before we go to the public hearing on, on both what Mary was just letting us know about um, and one other question. Um, so just to follow up on uh, the update uh, that we received at housing, uh, Mary, will some of the 1 million plus in CDBG funding be potentially available for some of the applicants who didn't receive funding? Is that one of the decisions that didn't receive funding, potentially doesn't receive funding in this round once the council makes that decision next week? Um, the supplemental funds have to specifically be used for activities to um, prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Um, so there may be some agencies that um, were not recommended for funding in the regular cycle that could receive funding um, with this uh, supplemental money, but the allocation process and recommendations for the use of that will be slightly different. And um, those recommendations will come to you through the city manager. I, I appreciate that. And I, um, I just wonder if some of those who serve very vulnerable populations, uh, such as Amistad, for instance, would be would they need to reapply and or how would that work i'd like some clarification on that at this point if i could sure um we probably will have some type of shortened or uh condensed application process um and you're correct there are some particularly in the social service categories that um, work with our most vulnerable population or and are on the street right now doing that work um, and they may be able to um, access some of this funding through um, a, either direct recommendation from the city manager or through a condensed um, application process. But again, the use to be specifically related to um, coronavirus efforts. So um, the funding can't be used to um, fund other organizations that aren't um, addressing the issues with the pandemic. Thank you, I appreciate that. And one other question, if I may, Mayor Schneider. Mm, of course. Thank you. Um, and that would be uh, maybe for the city manager or uh, for Mr. Purrington, if he's still on the line. Um, we've received, I've received, and I suspect the full council has received a number of emails. Um, that seem to be generated from the uh, Portland Parks Conservancy, uh, maybe an action alert, um, uh, in relation to a joint application from the Portland Parks Conservancy and our own Parks and Rec Division. And I just was um, curious if the manager could um, send along, at least to me, and if others are interested, uh, the original MOU with the Portland Parks Conservancy. Um, I've, and I appreciate um, their efforts uh, regarding the Riverton uh, Playground, uh, which is happens to be in the district that I represent and um, have been supportive uh, throughout the process of, of that ADA compliant uh, playground. I just wondered, um, I was surprised to see the Portland Parks Conservancy applying as an applicant, a co-applicant uh, for funding. When I understood our relationship with them as a funding organization to help our Parks and Rec, and now I'm seeing them as an applicant for funding, um, the uh, projects that we've actually funded um, substantially through our CIP process and then potentially also through our CDBG process, I hope. Um, so I was just hoping to uh, get a little more information um, about that co-application and, um, and potentially about the MOU of what we could be expecting from uh, the Portland Parks Conservancy. I also want to acknowledge that um, Nan and appreciate that Nan Cummings took the time to talk with me um, about that today. So I understand that she 
uh, drafted the application on behalf of the Parks Department at our own staff's request. Uh, and I wanted to thank Nan for taking the time to uh, explain to me how that came about in that process. So thank you, Nan, if you're watching uh, and, and the members of the Conservancy for your efforts uh, for our all of our parks and rec facilities in, in the uh, city of Portland. Thank you, Councillor Cook. I'll go to the city manager. Yes, um, thank you, Mayor. And Councillor, I'd be happy to provide the MOU. Um, little, I'm frankly a little surprised. I wasn't aware that there was that, um, the joint applications. So from, uh, from an advocacy standpoint, so I do know that the, the city um, does work very closely with the Conservancy, um, but I, I will speak with staff and get more detail as to um, the advocacy side of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, um, I, I can just let you know, Councillor Cook, I can send the application to you. It is not a formal MOU. It's rather a letter of support from the um, Conservancy on behalf of the project. I, I, Kelly, I think she's referring to the original MOU that established the Conservancy. So that's, that's correct. Thank you, City Manager. That's, yeah, he's that's correct. Right. So I, I will get that to you, Councillor. Okay. Um, although, although that's that's helpful information as well, Kelly. So thank you for chiming in there. Um, I'm going to look and see if I have any other hands from counselors, and if not, we will go right over to the public hearing. Okay, I don't see additional council hands up. Again, this will come again before you for a public hearing and action at our next meeting. Um, so we have um, Casey. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, great. Yes. Hi. Wonderful. Um, so I'm Casey Gilbert, the executive director of Portland Downtown, and I just wanted to address the council today. And first, I want to thank the CDBG Allocation Committee and the city manager and the council. I know you have incredibly difficult decisions to make, and every year with the CDBG process, we know that the demand outstrips the supply of funding and that all of the applicants are worthy. So I just wanna say, I know where you're starting from and um, just completely respect that. And today I am I want to address specifically the Peer Outreach Worker Program uh, in partnership with Amistad. Portland Downtown is a partner on this program and just wanted to make a couple of notes. The first is the Peer Outreach Worker Program was, the idea was really born um, based on data collected from our downtown cadet program, which is a partnership with the Portland Police Department. Um, Portland downtown helps to fund the salaries of the cadets, and it's just been a fantastic partnership. And what the cadets identified is that they were seeing a lot of social service need that they really weren't trained or capable to handle and thought that it would be great if they had an additional um, person who could partner and help them address some of the issues that they were seeing. And in the downtown management industry, we were seeing the peer outreach model being very successful um, in connecting those in need to services. So we were seeing it in other downtown management and placemaking efforts and found a really great partner in Amistad. Um, Portland downtown, uh, the downtown improvement district, you know, we were not the most well equipped to run this program. So it was important for us to find a local social service organization who could take this on. Um, the Peer Outreach Worker Program really does complement existing programs. Um, as you know, Portland Downtown makes a contribution every year to Milestone Foundation's home team. So we also know the incredible work that Milestone does and Preble Street does. And so we see the Peer Outreach Worker Program not taking away from, but really adding to those other models. And the data that we've gathered really shows positive outcomes of this program. And I know you're going to hear from Amistad and my program director, Amy Guerin, um, will speak at the next opportunity. So she's my data person, and I know she'll have plenty of talking points on that. But I just want to ask the committee to consider allocating funding for the PAL program. Um, I see it wasn't recommended, but just wanted to put in a shout out for that program um, and thank Amistad for their incredible partnership over the past two years. So with that, again, I thank you for letting me um, comment today and look forward to your decision. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight, Casey. Um, we will go to uh, Colin Ryan. 
Hi, uh, thank you for letting me comment. Um, I'm Cullen Ryan, the Executive Director of Community Housing in Maine, also a resident of Portland. And I just wanted to uh, first say thank you to Mary Davis for her excellent work and Kelly and Matt and all the efforts of the committee, as well as um, uh, John Jennings. And I wanted to just speak in support of the recommendations of the committee and the city manager and uh, note that this will allow some much needed affordable housing to be constructed and that that housing will be inclusive of some of our most vulnerable populations, uh, folks that particular now are exposed to being in a very vulnerable position. So I look forward to that. And uh, along with that, I just wanted to uh, say some positive words as well about the uh, Amistad Peer Outreach Worker Program. And just note that there are many hands involved in helping out the people who are the longest stayers in homelessness become housed. First of all, outreaching and forming those connections that allow uh, housing to become an option, and then the follow through once folks are housed. It's a lot of work and Amistad has been an excellent partner along with Milestone and all the others that have been working on this. So I just wanted to comment that since um, that is uh, a funding consideration as well. But I wanted to thank all of you for your careful consideration and know that the money doesn't stretch as far as it should. I am heartened that there'll be a second round and I hope that, that starts to reach all the corners of need in Portland. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Um, okay, we will go to, I see Reverend Chris. Hi, um, this is Christina Solari. I'm the minister of First Parish. Um, right on Congress Street. Good evening, Mayor Snyder and city councilors. Thank you so much for your great leadership and serving during this really challenging time. I also offer gratitude to the CBDG Allocation Committee for your good work. I know it's difficult. And thank you so much to John Jennings for your role as city manager and for recommending the first parish accessibility project as a recipient of grant funds from CBDG. So First Parish is truly a public meeting house in the heart of the city. We serve and meet some of the cultural, social, and spiritual needs of many diverse communities, including immigrants, poor people, many substance abuse recovery groups, people seeking a liberal faith, and cultural organizations like the Portland Conservatory of Music and the Gay Men's Choir. We also open our buildings to public events and lectures, as well as gatherings and rallies and marches. We are the home for many weddings and memorial services. The community actually uses our building exponentially more than our members. Um, and accessibility is crucial for so many people and even more critical as populations, the populations we serve age. So a part of the, it was part of our project, we've collaborated with the city to make Freshman Alley um, clean and safe for Portland High students and staff. And we are a historic gem in the city that's been an integral part of Portland for more than 200 years. Um, and our plans, our accessibility plans, um, preser preserve our buildings as a historic landmark while meeting modern demands. So we thank you for your consideration of supporting our project, which will benefit many, many people, groups, and organizations for the next 200 years. And I send blessings of hope to all of you and to all listening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Um, I'm just fixing my timer there. And we will go to Bob. I, I can't read your full last name, so I'm going to say Bob. And if you would let us know who you are, that'd be great. Okay, I think you're, oh, you're oh, muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here I am. Okay. There you are. Great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, this is uh, Bob Kearney, um, Vice Chair of the, on the board of the Maine Irish Heritage Center. And the Maine Irish Heritage Center would like to thank the members of the City Council, Mayor Kate Snyder, and City Manager John Jennings for your consideration of the Center's application for community development block grant funding. This funding will provide the final piece 
to make this Portland landmark accessible to all. We'd also like to express our gratitude to Mary Davis, Amanda Maffet, and Kelly Walsh from the Housing and Community Development Department and to the Allocation Committee for their support during the application process. Their attention to detail and guidance were invaluable to us. Your approval of our request will complete the accessibility project for the center. The funding will be used to make the last area of the interior open to all and will also stabilize the great granite steps, making it safer for people to use as they enter this historic building. The granite steps lead to the magnificent doors currently being restored using funds that were given to the center by the Irish government. These two projects and others follow the guide, guidance that was laid out in our master building plan for the center. The board and the friends of the Maine Irish Heritage Center are grateful for the support that the city of Portland has provided the center since the time that when Mayor Jim Cloutier presented the keys to the building to the Maine Irish Heritage Center founders, Jim Walsh back in January of 2003. Just wanna to add too that the center is uh, used by a lot of, uh, or has been used by a lot of the community uh, for various functions over the years and uh, has been open to, uh, to all, uh, in our, uh, not just uh, for the Irish immigrants, but to all immigrant uh, uh, residents and stuff uh, that come, uh, come to Portland and want to thank you again for your consideration and support. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. We'll go to Austin. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Austin Farah, and I'm a member of First Parish in Portland Unitarian Universalist Church and the co-chair of our church's accessibility project, Capital Campaign. First, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor, city council members, the city manager, and the members of the Community Development Block Grant Allocation Committee for all that you're doing on the city's behalf in this extraordinarily challenging time. You guys are doing a great job. Um, I'm here today to voice my support for the funding of the First Parish Accessibility Project under the CDBG program. First Parish is rich with history dating back to the founding of Portland. It's, uh, excuse me, established in 1674. The church moved to its current site in 1740 and built what was then the largest meeting hall in Maine. In October, 1819, First Parish hosted Maine's constitutional convention in this building. Six years later in 1825, this building was torn down to make way for the larger granite building and gardens that occupy our site today. In 2017, First Parish developed a plan to bring our early 19th century building up to 21st century standards. Our goal was to ensure that our facilities are truly accessible to all, enabling us to better serve both our members and the greater Portland community. To achieve this goal, First Parish decided to undertake a $1.2 million capital campaign. Launched last year, we have raised a little over 87% of our goal through the generous donations of our members and our supportive friends in the greater Portland community. The CDBG funding for which we have applied would significantly help us close the remaining gap. Over its long life, First Parish has welcomed all to its beautiful buildings and gardens in the heart of the city. The funds raised through our campaign will create gathering spaces that will suit the needs of our community for generations to come. We hope that you will look favorably on our funding request to help make this a reality. Thank you, I appreciate your, your listening. Thank you too for being here. Um, uh, we'll go to Bob Fowler. Hi, good evening. Um, I wanted to just add my thanks to uh, the Allocation Committee City Manager uh, and to you on the council for your consideration of, of our uh, application. Uh, we appreciate uh, always the investment of the 
the city in the home team, uh, and it is an investment uh, that ultimately saves the city uh, money in the neighborhood of about a quarter of a million dollars uh, has been uh, estimated by uh, one outside uh, evaluator. And, uh, and just in general, it improves the quality of life for everybody in the community, having the home team out on the streets. Uh, we have a formal collaboration uh, with Greater Portland Health and a part of the work uh, that the home team with Greater Portland Health is doing is providing medical outreach and psychiatric outreach services on the streets of Portland. And that's just uh, so critically needed. And I think for me, the thing uh, that defines the home team is uh, its ability and it, its work to bridge across the various uh, services and partners that exist uh, and operate in the city. Uh, I think we're so fortunate to have so many strong uh, providers and such quality partnerships in the city. And so I uh, appreciate the, uh, the recommendation for, for funding and uh, I, I thank you all for uh, all of your service. Thank you for being here, Bob. Uh, Laura. And I, I, I continue to apologize. Sometimes your name gets cut off, so I can just see it's Laura S I M. Uh, I think you need to unmute yourself, Laura. Hi, thank you. This is Laura Tomaso from the Immigrant Legal Advocacy Project. Um, I'm uh, in, sorry. <laughs> My name is Laura. I'm from the Immigrant Legal Advocacy Project with Catholic Charities. We submitted a joint application to the CDBG program to provide immigration legal services to Portland residents with low income. I'd like to thank the mayor, city council, city manager, and annual allocation committee for your work and the opportunity to speak this evening. In light of the critically important services provided by our fellow applicants, we are honored to be among the projects recommended for funding. The breadth and depth of programming represented tonight is remarkable and reflects the strength of Portland's nonprofit, social service, and community development organizations. In the current moment, it is clear just how vital each and every one of those organizations are. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone for all that you do. Demand for qualified, affordable immigration legal services in Portland far exceeds supply. As the only organizations in Maine certified to provide these services, ILAP and Catholic Charities are longtime collaborators helping people get their green cards and become proud U.S. citizens. ILAP also specializes in cases that require attorney expertise, such as those involving asylum, immigrant young people, and survivors of domestic violence, trafficking, or crime. For our immigrant neighbors with low income, legal status is the critical first step for transitioning out of poverty. Without legal status, immigrants do not have work authorization and cannot get a driver's license. Two must-haves for accessing and remaining in the workforce meeting their family's basic needs and advancing towards economic opportunity. A recent client success story illustrates the scope of our work. Three years ago, a mother and her two teenage daughters came to ILAP after being referred by the local shelter where they were staying. The family were survivors of domestic violence and had experienced homelessness for years before arriving in Portland. Like many others, it was incredibly complicated for them to get legal status but their ILAP attorney used her knowledge of immigration law to skillfully develop and file their case under the protections available for domestic violence survivors. Having access to expert legal guidance opened up new opportunities for the family. They found permanent housing and were able to start working while their case was pending. And earlier this year, after three years of ups and downs, starts and stops, they learned that they had been granted green cards. With the stability of this permanent legal status, they are now pursuing educational opportunities and moving forward with their lives. Despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, ILAP and Catholic Charities are providing our immigration legal services remotely to meet growing needs in the community. We are grateful for the opportunity to continue this work with the support of the CDBG program in 2020 and 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, Laura. Uh, we will now go to Hannah. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Hannah DeAngelis, and I'm the Director of Refugee and Immigration Services for Catholic Charities Maine. And I first would really like to thank the members of the Allocation Committee, 
Mayor Snyder, the Portland City Council, and City Manager Jennings. Um, we know there's a lot of time and effort put into reviewing proposals, and we're just very grateful for the opportunity to address you. Um, I'm also here, like Laura, in support of our joint committee, uh, our, our joint proposal with the Immigrant Legal Advocacy Project um, to provide more immigrant legal services um, for residents in Portland. So Catholic Charities and ILAP together um, provide free and low cost qualified immigration legal advice, case preparation and representation. At present, there are no other agencies in the state of Maine that are nationally accredited by the US Department of Justice to provide these services. Our two agencies are collaborating on this project so we can most efficiently serve clients through our close and regular coordination, information sharing and our consultation together. We accept referrals of clients from many other refugee and immigrant serving organizations, such as Maine Access Immigrant Network and Hope House. Um, the accreditation program was developed by the Department of Justice because they wanted to send a clear message to immigrants that there are providers who can deliver accurate and affordable services. It's very, very important at a time where the demand for immigration legal services far outweighs supply in our city. Um, I have a recent success story that really explains why this work is so important. Um, so this year, a Somali refugee approached our program for help reuniting with her 13-year-old daughter um, who was living in a refugee camp in Dadaab, Kenya. The daughter had stayed behind with her father when our refugee client came here in 2011, but the girl's father soon passed away, leaving her an orphan in the camp. As a US citizen, a refugee can petition to bring her children. However, this formerly straightforward petition is now very complex due to President Trump's 2017 travel ban, which bars nationals of seven countries, including Somalia. Catholic Charities worked with supervising attorneys at the Catholic Legal Immigration Network to appeal to the embassy in Nairobi for a waiver, and that waiver was approved. So just five months after our refugee client came to our program for help, her daughter made the long journey from Kenya to Maine and was reunited with her mother in Portland after eight years of separation. The story is just one example of the importance of qualified immigration legal services for our Portland community. So even during this pandemic, um, the Immigrant Legal Advocacy Project and Catholic Charities are still continuing to provide our services remotely um, in face of a truly exponentially growing need in our community. We are very grateful for the opportunity to continue this work with the support of the CDBG program in 2020 and 21. And we thank you for your consideration of our work. Boy, perfect timing. Thank you very much Anna, for being with us tonight. Um, and we'll go to Lori Moses. Hi, um, thank you so much. This is um, Lori Moses. I'm the executive director of Catherine Morrill Day Nursery. Um, and I want to thank certainly the allocations committee, um, the mayor Snyder, city manager Jen Jennings, and um, everybody who works on the staff. Um, tonight, I'm only going to speak on the city manager's recommendations for the two CDBG construction grant applications that we applied for. One was for energy efficiency, and the other grant was for life safety repairs. Um, in 1919, Catherine Morrill Day Nursery um, began as the Portland Baby Hygiene and Child Welfare Association, serving Portland's youngest and most vulnerable citizens. As Maine's first licensed child care center in 1967, we have continued to prioritize low to moderate income families, families whose children have a developmental delay, and children who are involved in the child welfare system. We have a diverse clientele, which is one of our greatest strengths. Our building at 96 Danforth Street was constructed in the 19, 1830s as a ship captain's home. We have been located here since 1922. We are currently licensed to serve 85 children from six weeks to five years in our six classrooms. The majority of our funding comes from parent tuition, both private tuition and third party funding that families may be eligible for. The highest percentage of our budget goes for labor related costs due to required group sizes and ratios. Providing childcare for infants and toddlers is more expensive than it is for pre preschoolers, which is why there is such a shortage for childcare for this age group. But we know with 80% of brain developing development occurring before age three, the early years are the more, most important developmental years. The building maintenance costs is another large expense in our budget, but the construction work that is required to deal with the items in our grant applications 
is beyond the scope of our operating budget. Our energy efficiency grant was is response to an energy audit that was conduct, conducted on our building in 2016. Work includes um, replacing fluorescent, fluorescent wrap lighting fixtures with LED lamps, replacing our dilapidated entry door and installation of insulation in the attic and the basement. Our life safety repairs grant is due to, is to do painting and abatement work for lead paint on the floor where our materials are stored in the attic, repairing the fr rotting front entryway and excavation and replacement of the pipe where the water leaks in the basement. Currently, we are not able to use the washing machine which has been a challenge and an expense for us. Interestingly, there was a news story this past November about the water pipes in Portland. Apparently in 1869, in response to the fires in Portland, several businessmen responded by forming the Portland Water District. They connected a pipe from Sebago Lake to Portland. The first address was 96 Danforth Street. Lori, would you like a little more time? Just one more sentence, thank you. Thank you. I, I assume that the pipes that have been replaced since then but based on the video from the scoping we had done recently, there are many rocks and tree roots that have destroyed the pipe. These funds will rectify that situation. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you very much for being here with us this evening. Uh, we will go to Camelia. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 good evening, Mr. Jennings, Mayor Snyder, and City Councilors. My name is Camelia Babson-Haley, and I am the Executive Director of Youth and Family Outreach. Uh, we're located at 331 Cumberland Avenue, and I am also a Portland resident and reside at 10 Beale Street. I'm here to speak on behalf of the five early care and education providers who seek scholarship funds for our families through the Portland Child Care Voucher Collaborative. Um, but before I say my part, I'd like to also thank the volunteers on the allocation committee for their hard work. It's not an easy task to score all of these very worthy applications. Um, this past year at Youth and Family Outreach alone, um, I was able to keep six single mothers from losing their jobs with this scholarship money. Additionally, I was able to keep one teen mom and a 15 year old couple in high school at Portland High School with these funds. I was able to keep them in school with these funds. This money was used when there was nothing else available for these families. And we know that childcare is the foundation to workforce development and creating economic opportunities for families. So I'm grateful that the city manager recommended to partially fund our request. And I hope that the city council will consider supporting this recommendation. Without these funds, we would be unable to support families who have no other means of paying for childcare so that they can go to work or stay in school. And I'd also like to just take a moment and thank each of you for all of that you're doing right now to take care of our community during these really uncertain times. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here this evening with us. Uh, Brian Townsend. And Brian, you just need to unmute. Yep, there you go. Thank you all so much. Um, this is Brian Townsend. I'm the executive director at uh, Amistad, and we're headquartered currently at 66 State Street. Um, we are very grateful um, to the allocation committee for the work that they do and um, uh, understand that a lot of times it's, first of all, a thankless proposition to make those make that calculus. But I know from our position that our all of our programming and especially our peer outreach worker program, which is up for a consideration for funding is sometimes harder to discern in terms of value and impact um, because of the nature of the work. I think street outreach uh, is a very uh, unique and very important bit of work in Portland, but it's also largely invisible. And for an agency that just doesn't do a lot of self-promotion, I think, I think it's hard for us to really enter ourselves onto the radar. Um, I do know that our, you know, our partners um, see the value in the work, uh, the Portland police, um, folks who work at the library, um, others who work in, in the downtown area and who have a sort of a front row seat to our work uh, do understand um, the value and the, the considerable risk, I think, to the, to the downtown area and to the folks we serve and having that service extracted. Um, 
I also want to note that um, listening to uh, what the city manager said uh, regarding the value in uh, rotating new recipients into the CDBG process, uh, that's something that resonates with, with us as well. I think that's, there's a real high value for Portland in that. And going into this year, after two years of um, funding that Portland Downtown and Amistad received to do this work, uh, we were hoping to be able to bolster the existing program through CDBG so that we were positioned to uh, leverage and attract more funding to make it a more sustainable uh, part of the Portland landscape, you know, absent uh, funding from CDBG in the future. Um, it's, uh, you know, famously difficult to fund uh, street outreach. There just isn't a lot of you know, specific streams of funding that attach to it. Um, so we're always, we've always been grateful um, that the city uh, through this process has recognized um, what Amistad and Portland downtown are able to do. Um, I also just really want to briefly touch on the fact that um, um, the, the team we have on the street has shifted uh, its work considerably in the last several weeks. Um, we are lucky to have the flexibility to do that in terms of our personnel and also in terms of how this, um, how our agreement with the city was built. Uh, it's really rather flexible to meet the needs uh, of folks on the streets as they present themselves. And obviously in the last six weeks, those needs have shifted considerably. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of services sidelined and suspended and we've been really Lucky, and I'm personally really proud uh, that we've been able to stay uh, in action and just uh, shift our priorities to delivering food and essential resources to anyone uh, in Portland who was presenting in need, uh, partnering with some of the local restaurants, par partnering with Good Shepherd um, Food Bank, uh, and really just being able to stay impactful and meaningful to folks, especially those experiencing homelessness, uh, but also to families and others just experiencing food insecurity uh, and other new risks in the face of this pandemic. Um, so I, I um, agree with uh, what has already been said in terms of... Um, Need a little more time, Brian? You know, I'll just, I will sign off and just say thank you for your consideration and I appreciate your attention to us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we've got one more hand up at this moment, which is uh, Jen. Hi there, Jen. Could you tell us your Could you just tell us your last name? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, Jen Sporzinski, and um, I'm a senior vice president at CEI. Um, I'm also a Portland resident, and um, I just wanted to thank the allocation committee and City Manager Jennings uh, for recommending our proposal, uh, which is the Portland Microenterprise Assistance Project, and that's in the economic development category. Uh, CI is a mission-based lender. We're working to create good jobs, environmentally sustainable businesses, and shared prosperity in Maine. Uh, we accomplish this by integrating financing, business, and industry expertise, and policy solutions in Maine. Uh, this project will uh, enable us to provide business advising to low- and moderate-income Portland residents primarily women and immigrants, and help them start a business in Portland. And importantly, this funding allows us to bring in additional federal money as it serves as a match. Um, I will say this year is going to be really challenging for Portland's micro businesses. Uh, we're ready for that challenge. Right now, we're, um, we're very active in helping Portland's small business access some of the Federal CARE Act funding um, and a whole host of different private foundation grants to help them stay in business. And while staying in business is not a metric of this um, particular project and funding, it is one thing that we think we're gonna be spending a lot of time on this year. Um, and then I will say, I think we'll be ready to shift into working to help rebuild Portland's microenterprise. I think that's gonna be the primary uh, work for us. So again, I just wanted to thank you for uh, recommending our funding. And also, as all have said, thanks for your uh, work and leadership during this time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Okay, we, we've got some more hands that have gone up. And so we will go to David O. 
Hello, everybody. Um, my name is David Oceanbein. I'm uh, the director of Portland Programming with Amistad. And I just want to, first of all, thank you guys. Um, this is my first time speaking in this forum, so um, I may be a little bit uh, rough around the edges, but I, uh, I really appreciate you guys. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult times. There's a lot on everybody's plate, and I just really appreciate you guys taking the time to hear my voice and, and all of our voices. Um, I guess I just kind of want to talk about um, our our peer outreach worker program and um, just kind of some of the stuff they're doing right now in the moment. Um, we're actively distributing food. Um, as it's been pointed out to uh, previously, there's not a lot of services going on, uh, not a lot of social services um, engaging with some very vulnerable folks on the streets right now. And um, our peer outreach worker is um, doing some amazing work. He actually recently just uh, found someone housing who's been homeless, who's been chronically homeless for decades, it seems like, and um, just through due diligence and hard work and building those relationships and also um, just being a good community partner with um, different housing agencies, different, um, different entities within the city of Portland as well, and um, just continuing to do the work when there's really no other outreach program right now kind of assisting some folks. Um, there is there is always a very finite amount of funding for stuff like this and um and we definitely understand there's a lot of other there's a lot of programs out there that need it but just um I think in this current crisis we're in the peer outreach worker program is actually really doing some some heavy lifting of um, engagement with folks um trying to unmarginalize some marginalized people and kind of get their needs in into the light and um, get some of their needs met. Um, I'm starting to meander, I'm starting to uh, to wander a little bit. So I think I'm gonna cut things short, but um, I just wanna say thank you very much everybody for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I really appreciate your efforts and I hope everybody uh, stays safe during this and, um, and thank you for uh, hearing my spiel about trying to uh, get the peer outreach worker uh, program allocated some funds. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, Norman Mays. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mayor, city councilors, thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Norman Mays and I am a board member for, for Amistad and deputy director at Shalom House. I wish to provide my observations of the value that Amistad's and Portland Downtown's Peer Outreach Worker Program brings to Portland. I want to thank the Mayor, City Council, and City Manager for seeing the value of funding the Peer Outreach Worker Program for the past couple of years. Unfortunately, this outreach program was not selected to be funded through the City's CWG allocation process for next fiscal year. I'm requesting that this decision be reconsidered and prioritized the Peer Outreach Worker Program, the reasons why I ask are several. Understandably, the COVID pandemic has significantly curtailed street, out street outreach work in Portland. Yet one bright spot that continues is the important work being done by the Peer Outreach Worker Program, which serves people experiencing homelessness who spend a great deal of time living in our downtown streets. However, the Peer Outreach worker program is not a standalone approach. It maximizes its relationships with multiple community partners, including other homeless providers around the city, assisting city staff at the Oxford Street Shelter and at other emergency shot, excuse me, sites with mutual clients, as well as supporting Milestone's home team, especially now. The work of the peer outreach worker program is even more important at this time when other outreach providers are unable to do this great work that they usually do under normal conditions. During this crisis, Amistad's outreach worker has been collecting and distributing food boxes, meals, and other essentials to make a life-saving difference for those on the streets of Portland. The program also continues to work with other housing providers and rental subsidy programs like the ones I oversee at Shalom House. The peer outreach worker has not stopped referring their clients experience homelessness and therefore we are able to continue to get these individuals off the street and into housing, overcoming the new challenges everyone is currently facing. The need for this critical lifeline to remain in place throughout the year is more important than ever for those experiencing homelessness in our community. It requires a great deal of time and effort to build the trust that our outreach worker has built over years with these individuals contending with life on the street. 
In addition, this service provides an essential service to downtown businesses and an important contact person for other service providers, including our police department and other emergency responders when an individual on the street is struggling. Without this resource, downtown business owners and our community providers will have a greater challenge finding ways to respond to individuals experiencing such struggles. I ask that you reconsider the recommendation of the CDBG allocation and to fund this invaluable essential service and find a way to assure that it continues to serve our neighbors experiencing homelessness on our streets as our outreach continues to, to do so uninterrupted throughout the, this current crisis. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you for being here. Um, okay, and we uh, will move over to George Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, uh, 28 Hanover Street. Um, so I wanted to make a strong uh, suggestion that the housing trust fund uh, currently has a great deal of money in it. In fact, I think half a million dollars is currently set aside to literally sit there and do nothing uh, to help show the council's bona fides on housing development. Um, I have a lot of reservations about the CHOM development on Middle Street, but if it's going to happen, that $200,000 uh, should be coming out of the housing trust fund and not uh, taking away from other projects in the community development block program. Um, that's an easy one. And I'm kind of disappointed that there wasn't more creativity in, in diverting that project in that direction from the beginning. So everyone's time wasn't wasted. Um, with respect to the process overall, uh, I've mentioned in the past that we don't get minutes of the allocation committee's work that are made public, um, specifically attendance. Uh, it would be great to know how many of uh, the committee members actually attended uh, various meetings and who didn't. Uh, we laud their work, but we don't actually get to know for sure what that work actually consisted of. I also, um, wish there could be a role in the process for the efficacy of these programs. The community policing $150,000 has been around for a long, long time, and it should be part of the city's budget. And the fact that the federal government is funding year after year, our community policing program is strange and weird, and also counterproductive because we're spending $150,000 of this federal grant money to basically take a law and order approach while starving programs like Amistad from work that could actually divert a lot of the more troublesome people on the street to social services that could actually make them less of a nuisance to many of the people in, in the areas that the community policing uh, liaisons are spending a lot of time fielding complaints about. So again, um, I certainly uh, have more to say about individual projects. The Freshman Alley project directly benefits several commercial properties in the, in the vicinity, and they should be matching uh, some of that funding to improve that, that alley. And therefore, less public CBD you know, money would, be, would have to be required to fund that project. That's the kind of creativity that we should be looking for we hear so much from the city manager about public-private partnership this, public-private partnership that, but we don't actually see that creativity in these kinds of opportunities. We just see these grant monies being used as political currency. So it's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, and we'll go to Stephen Scharf. <clears throat> Stephen Scharf of Cumberland Avenue. Um, just want to uh, weigh in on the... Uh, we need policing grant money. Uh, for several years, it's been $150,000. Uh, and certainly the cost of managing that program uh, has gone up. And I'm not suggesting that this year's allocation goes up, but I think the consideration should be to increase that allocation in future years to uh, mirror whatever the cost increase is for community policing. Um, I'm a um, strong advocate of continued community policing. We actually should be doing a lot more community policing than we are uh, throughout the city and uh, would encourage us to move forward with that, but specifically to 
150 should be definitely increased to a higher amount. Um, and um, um, just uh, wanted to weigh in on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and we will go to Heather Zimmerman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Heather Zimmerman, and I'm the advocacy director at Preble Street and a resident of Portland. Um, and wanted to thank you, Mayor Snyder, and the rest of the council for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, and also wanted to thank the allocation committee and the city manager Jennings for seeing the value of providing funding to essential Preble Street programs, um, specifically the food programs, Florence House, Women's Shelter, and the Joe Chrysler Teen Shelter. Um, quickly, the food program has shifted dramatically in our operations over the past six weeks um, to face the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have worked hard to uh, distribute meals out to some of our usual partners, as well as um, additional service providers and shelters across the city to deliver meals on site. And then we have shifted our kitchen programs in the soup kitchen. So no one is coming into the soup kitchen anymore, of course, but delivering to go meals as needed for folks that come to the kitchen. And then I think the most notable change has been shifting the food pantry to a daily food pantry. So typically the food pantry operates on a weekly basis. It's now a daily food pantry. Um, and so all told those changes just in the month of March led us to serve 18,000 more meals than we had ever served in a single month, including last summer when we had the increase in people seeking asylum, which of course we all remember talking about about a year ago and know the strain on services that that created. But um, you know, and that so that that increase, that eighteen thousand meal increase, was just in the month of March, and that really just came in, through increased needs in the last seven to ten days of the month. So certainly, as we close out on April, um, we'll be able to provide numbers on the increased need across this month and looking towards May. You know, it's it's hard to imagine um, what the increased emergency food need will be through May and really longer term, knowing that. Um, the economic downturn will likely last much longer for the lowest income residents of the city, which we learned certainly out of the 2008 economic uh, recession. Uh, and then quickly, of course, in our emergency shelters, both the Florence House Shelter and the Joe Pez Slurteen Shelter, continuing to provide 24-7 um, hour um, physical shelter, access to meals and staffing to support some of our most vulnerable community members and ensuring that our protocols meet the recommendations of the CDC as well as other public health um, providers, but just doing everything we can in partnership, of course, with the city and other um, providers that have spoken tonight to ensure that we are maintaining the safety of people needing emergency shelter as well as the rest of us across the city of Portland. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, yes, I do. Sarah McNevich. Hi, um, Sarah McNevich. I'm a Bayside resident. And uh, first, I'd, I'd like to add my appreciation of Amistad and, uh, and recognize their import, importance as a really respectful community partner. Um, for several months last year, I had the opportunity to assist a woman who was experiencing homelessness and um, living out of her car for several months before finding housing. And, and she, was, she was really clear that of the many providers in Portland, she really felt that Amistad made her feel the most safe and supported. And um, I think that's, that's probably the most important endorsement. And I, I encourage you to support Amistad uh, whenever and wherever possible. Um, and I'd also like to call attention to something said by a previous speaker, um, the, the allocation committee member who spoke toward the beginning. Um, he mentioned that one of the objectives of the CDGP funding is to support organizations that reduce blight and uh, supporting vulnerable people should go hand in hand with reducing blight, but sometimes those concepts seem to be um, at odds, um, particularly in Bayside. And I, I don't believe for a minute that it has to be that way. So um, I'm asking the council to carefully consider which organizations 
best support the objective of reducing or at least not exacerbating blight um, in Bayside and, and to assess whether going forward new organizations might have a more um, collaborative and holistic approach to achieving the goals that, that we all share. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Um, okay, I do not see any more hands um, on the attendee side of our list. And so I'm just gonna give it one more second. I'm gonna close the public hearing on this item this evening. Um, and again, thank you to everybody who has been listening. Thank you to all of our speakers. We do really appreciate this and we'll have another opportunity to hear from you at our next meeting, which is scheduled to be May 4th. Okay, um, does somebody wanna text uh, Councillor Chong? Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we will um, uh, head to the unfinished business portion of our agenda and will the clerk please read order 161. Order 161, accepting and appropriating $25,000 grant technology institute for the confined aquatic disposal cell design and permitting project sponsored by John P. Jennings, city manager. Thank you. And um, would you like to speak to this city manager? Um, thank you, Mayor. This is, um, we received a grant um, from the Maine Technology Institute uh, as part of our um, efforts to create the CAD cell. Um, Greg Mitchell, I know is on the call, on the, on the call and he could provide any um, details, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much. So we will wait until we get into councilor comments and questions. Um, at the moment, I will look to see if there's any public comment on this item. And seeing none, I'm going to look for a motion. Second. I've got a uh, motion by councilor Costa with a second by councilor Ray. And is there any council comment or questions at this time? I don't see any hands, although I will say thank you to uh, Greg Mitchell for being with us this evening in case there were any hands. Um, looking around again, okay. If not, then we will simply go to the roll call vote, please. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavadonis. Yes. Councilor Cook. Yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. So that passes unanimously. Many thanks to MTI for additional funding. And will the clerk please read Order 162? Order 162, amendment to the Portland City Code, Chapter 35, regarding temporary adult use marijuana testing license, sponsored by John P. Jennings, City Manager. Great, thank you. And City Manager, would you mind um, giving us a little summary here. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as the council knows that we were in the process of bringing forward um, a package of licenses that would uh, for, for retail adult use uh, marijuana. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has uh, sidetracked that a bit. Um, we are still prepared to do that. But in the interim, the state had approached us about testing facilities and specifically um, granting temporary licenses uh, to these facilities in order that they can, can become operational in the city. Um, Antor Grossa and Jessica Hanscom are both on the call if you have any specific questions or, uh, or concerns. Thank you very much. And we will come back to you. I'm gonna to look to see whether or not there's any public comment on this item. And I don't see any, no wait, I do. Um, okay, so we'll go to public comment, same, same rules apply. If you wouldn't mind giving us your name and address and I'll give you three minutes and we appreciate you being here. We'll go to, uh, Eric, I think it's Eric Gunderson. Yep, hi, can you all hear me? Hi, yep. Hi everybody, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Eric Gunderson, uh, Director of the Office of Marijuana Policy and also proud Portland resident. Um, uh, I appreciate you taking this up, hi. Uh, and giving uh, consideration to this. This is from the state's perspective an opportunity to us to set the table to be able to implement as quickly and as safely as possible after this public health pandemic has cleared up. 
uh, and it's uh, responsible and permissible from a public health and safety standpoint. Um, obviously, testing is crucial to our regulated system to make sure that at the very least consumers understand what is in their product and what isn't. Um, and again, uh, much like everybody else, uh, our operations have been, uh, uh, we've needed to adjust on the fly with the whole public health pandemic. Uh, so this is just an opportunity for us to set the table and again, to quickly and safely implement as soon as uh, it's uh, feasible. So I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Great, thank you for being here, Eric. And I don't see any other public comment. I don't see any hands raised. So I'm going to look to the council for a motion. Move passage. Second. I've got a motion by Councillor Ray with a second by Councillor Cook. And is there any council comment or questions? Uh, we'll go to Councillor Ray. You're mute, uh, Belinda, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> you were doing that. Like I look up and it says mute and I say, I don't want to be mute. So I click it and then I get it. <laughs> but um, so uh, I was hoping to get from city staff a timeline when we think we might be bringing forward the other rules and regulations. Um, Councilor, this is uh, uh, the city manager. I, I, I feel as though that we could bring that forward um, in the within the next month, um, certainly. I think what we've been trying to do is hold off a bit just to get um, the COVID-19 issues behind us, uh, at least get us at a point where all the stay at home orders are satisfactory and we do. Um, and so I think we could uh, potentially bring that fairly soon. Uh, I'll talk certainly talk with the mayor and city staff um, about timing on that, but it's, we're ready to, we're ready to bring it back to you. Great. Thank you. I, I think we were supposed to, before this all happened, we, were, we had a workshop scheduled and then I think it was going to be on our April 6th, our first April meeting for the second read. We've already had a first read, right? And we need a second read on the rules and regs. Um, so the reason I ask is because a couple of people commented uh, via email asking for us to create a similar opportunity for cultivation and manufacturers to get a temporary license. And I wrote back and said, I think, you know, our rules are coming. They're not that far away. I don't anticipate needing to do that. And, and they were just concerned because the way all the licensing works, you end up getting a conditional license from the state, but they won't grant you an active one until you get municipal approval. So I just wanted to make sure we were kind of had a view as to when we might bring it forward and knowing that that's coming in the next month or so um, makes me feel that we don't need to expand this to offer any other kind of temporary license at this time so i'm comfortable with what's before us i understand why the state is asking for this i think staff did a nice job drafting very quickly regulations aimed specifically at the testing facilities so um I am comfortable supporting this tonight, and I thank you for the timeline update. Thank you, Councillor Ray. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Ray. I uh, wanted to echo Councillor Ray's um, questions and concerns about when we might see the more permanent ordinance, uh, particularly on the not terribly controversial parts about processing and cultivation. And uh, if we're not able to go to first read, I think the first read may have been in the meeting that we didn't have on the 16th of March. That's right. So I think we will need a first read and a second read. And if that's not able to happen in the next month, I guess I would ask that we move forward with a temporary licensing for cultivation and processing um, in the port in Portland, given that we have three or four businesses, I believe, in the city who uh, have, oh, sorry, hit my button. Um, who have qualified uh, for provisional or temporary, uh, I guess, provisional uh, state licenses pending a city license. And um, if we could move forward on those at the very least, uh, I think that would be um, of benefit given the amount of um, money our small businesses have 
uh, invested. Now, a couple of those are in district, my district, but I know they're also in other districts around this city. And I've heard from both uh, constituents as well as business owners in my district about uh, the burden on the delay. So I would uh, second, I guess, the urgency on bringing forward either a temporary or a permanent uh, piece, given the amount of work done in uh, the committees. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Are there any other council comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the city clerk to call for the vote. Councillor Dusan. Yes. Council Mavadonis. Yes. Councillor Cook. Yes. Councillor Ali. Yes. Councillor Costa. Yes. Council Ray. Yes. Council Thibodeau. Yes. Council Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. And that also passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody, and thanks too for um, for the the questions. Um, we will now move into our order 167. Um, and just to give a little bit of framing here, um, uh, this the, the underlying um, order here is extension of our stay at home order. Um, we've got several amendments that will be considered this evening, but I just wanted to remind um, folks, particularly in the public, that the underlying order has to do with extension of Portland's stay at home order until May 18th. Um, so with that, would the clerk please um, read Order 167. Order 167, extending the emergency proclamation sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not gonna give additional comment um, uh, beyond what I said other than to say um, that we will go straight to counselors um, who will tee up amendments that are coming our way so that folks in the public who are here to give public comment on this item tonight um, are mindful of everything that's before us and then we'll uh, close public comment and go into um, uh, discussion of the of the order. So I'm going to do that I'm going to do everything um, on this item in the order in which it exists in our agenda. And I apologize. Um, because I'm bouncing around with electronics here. Okay, the first, um, we've got two items from Councillor Cook, um, amendment number one and number two. Councillor Cook, would you mind um, summarizing those for us? Thank you, Mayor. I will start with amendment number one, which was an amendment uh, that would uh, refund in a short-term rental um, fee and waive a long-term rental fee for those choosing to convert. I am not going to offer that amendment this evening, uh, given uh, that I heard some concerns from council and members of the public that waiving um, licensing fees or refunding licensing fees could really go beyond short-term rentals and into other business licensing. And I took that to heart and thought that maybe we were better off uh, going straight to uh, my amendment two. So with Amendment 2, uh, that I sent out uh, to the full council, and I believe it was posted as well to the city website this afternoon, a revised Amendment 2. And that has to do with uh, what I'm calling an affordable housing uh, incentive program. And it would allow for uh, property owners who have an existing short-term rental um, non-owner occupied short-term rental uh, dwelling unit to uh, receive a $1,000 incentive payment out of our housing trust fund if they gave up their short-term rental registration and also registered for a long-term rental and actually rented to a, uh, a tenant who is receiving section eight or uh, general assistance vouchers. And uh, if there are other subsidized housing programs that are eligible, I'd be willing to amend it uh, to provide for those. But essentially the, the, entire, um, the entire proposal is meant to incentivize dwelling units, which are currently used for the uh, lodging 
industry to come back into housing and specifically back into housing for those who receive some sort of assistance with uh, their housing payments, whether that be Section 8 or general assistance uh, through our own um, programs at the city or other programs. And so that is what um, Amendment 2 is meant to do. I have also in the revisions uh, limited the amount of the housing trust fund that could be expended for this program to $25,000, which would mean 25 housing units uh, if there was, if, if property owners so desired, it would be based on a first come, first serve basis. And I, in my hope, I, you know, I will be honest, I don't know um, that property owners would um, come forward and switch their dwelling units from uh, lodging into housing uh, for these purposes. But I thought, uh, given these uncertain times, given this pandemic where we have families that were housing uh, in hotels, and given the uh, also the hazards of the shelter situation, that if we could incentivize folks and allow our own staff to have an ability to place those in need of housing into housing, that this might be an incentive that we could uh, consider. And if it were um, if it were successful, we might see 25 units more uh, of housing in the city. And if it's not, we won't be out any dollars out of our housing trust fund. So that's that's the basics. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, Councillor Dusan, um, you've got amendment number three in the packet tonight. Yes, it's a pretty straightforward uh, request for the council to consider removing the language relating to whether or not gun purchases or services um, are an essential service in the city. Um, and I offer it uh, because I think the language that we added last time um, inadvertently feeds into the notion that uh, any of our concerns about guns, uh, that, that our concern here is about guns versus our concern being about public health. Um, and since there is no, as far as I know, I'll look, I'm looking at Danielle and hope she's gonna um, correct me if I'm wrong. When a commenter said at the last meeting that there were no, there was nothing here in the city of Portland, um, I didn't respond because I just, I wasn't sure if that was the case. But if it is the case that there's nothing there's no service like this available in the city of Portland. It just doesn't seem necessary for us to take this on. And so I would propose that we either strike it from this order or make sure it is not included uh, if we uh, create another order um, when this one expires. Thank you, Councillor Dusan. Um, Councillor Ray, you've got Amendment 4. Yes, so Amendment 4 um, aligns construction our approach to construction with the state's approach to construction. So the state has construction listed as an essential service. We do not. Um, and in fact, from reading the FAQs on our website, we are not only not allowing construction that was not permitted prior to March 25th, we are also not allowing any construction that would not require a permit. So essentially, basic home repair is off the table in Portland. Um, so this would put construction back as an essential service and have the city approach it the same way as the state. Thank you. Uh, and the amendment number five is co-sponsored by Councillor Ray and Councillor Cook. Yes. I'm just coming down here. So this is the one that would um, give us the same approach here in Portland to non-essential businesses that the state has taken. So they would still have to meet all of the guidelines in terms of closing their public facing uh, workspaces um, and facilities, but they could operate through no contact means that are deemed okay by the state. And, and we've written it in a way that just aligns it with the state. So that if further guidance comes out from the state, then we would still be aligned. 
And it's very clear too, we, we added in language from the city. We didn't add the language from the city, but we kept language from the city and added language from the state to make sure it was very clear that there was no customer vendor or other visitor in-person contact allowed. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cook, amendment number six. Thank you. Uh, I think amendment number six has to do with real estate. <laughs> so um, this amendment was, I brought this amendment really to um, align with what I had understood we were trying to do at our last meeting, to tell you the truth. So um, essentially protect tenants with some additional protections compared to the state, but otherwise align with the state. And so since this amendment would essentially say if a if a unit is occupied by a tenant or a dwelling unit, whether that's a single family home, a condo or an apartment, if it's occupied by a tenant, there'll be no real estate activities in it. But otherwise, um, real estate activities would be allowed except for multifamilies uh, in excess of four units, four units being the dividing line between our sort of commercial mortgage and a residential mortgage as I understand it in that market. So um, this was really brought as a clarification based on um, the city of uh, Portland uh, frequently asked questions where a unoccupied condo uh, was not allowed to be sold in a five unit building. So I'm just trying to um, put forward something that helps to clarify what I think was our intent, but also just for our discussion and to allow sort of uh, allow real estate activities to occur, um, except where we're not impacting um, tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. And then we go to amendment number seven, which is Councillor Thibodeau. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, this amendment would require um, both essential and non-essential employees to wear um, face coverings or face masks. Um, it would not, um, uh, require somebody who has some sort of medical condition that wouldn't allow them to wear a face covering or mask um, to be required to do so. Obviously, that doesn't make any sense. This order would, uh, this this addition would take effect on April 30th. Um, I did receive some feedback from other counselors that um, that they would like to see some additional language with respect to employees that don't interact with the public. So I just want to let folks know that I will be, I will be um, adding some additional language if that's the direction of the council and I'm happy to provide it at that time, but essentially that additional language would cover um, folks uh, who, any employee who does not interact with the public and can maintain uh, six feet of social distance from um, another employee. And then just lastly, I would note that there was a companion amendment to this one, which dealt uh, more broadly with um, the public, uh, but given the time frame we were under and the lack of guidance um, that we had from where the state was going to come out, um, I did not bring that amendment forward here. And so I know the governor is going to speak on this tomorrow. And so we'll see for next week. So I just wanted to, um, to frame that for the discussion as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thibodeau. Um, so uh, councillors have been busy. Thank you. Um, responding to our stay at home order. So as we consider the extension of the order, we're considering several changes. And um, thank you for giving summaries so that those folks from the public who will speak to us tonight have those things in mind as we go there, uh, which we will now, I see a hand up from Councilor Ray. Do you have something, Councilor Ray? Yeah, just one other thing. I didn't prepare an amendment, but I'm just curious when we get into the discussion as to how my colleagues feel about the date. I know we have another meeting next week. Um, I understand that every time we revisit this, it's a huge issue. It takes a very long time, and, and that maybe we would like to wait till the 18th to do that again. But with, with the knowledge that the governor is speaking tomorrow, um, and that there might be some changes at the state. I'm just wondering if people are open to the idea of extending it for one week and then doing it again. I'm not gonna propose that at this time, but if people can kind of address that in their comments, that would be great to hear. Thank you, Councillor Ray. 
Yes, that's right. Our first um, official meeting in May is next Monday, the 4th. So we'll be um, back here a week from now and the governor's stay at home order expires on the 30th. Um, so we will head over to the attendees and start to take some public comment on um, order 167. Okay, great. I see Mary Alice Scott from Portland by local is with us. So Mary Hi, Alice and, and, and everyone, just, just normal rules. I'll give you three minutes if you wouldn't mind stating your name and address and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. So it's Mary Alice Scott with Portland by local and I live at Beckett Street in Portland. Um, I just wanna thank all of you. I know that you all have um, had a lot of comments coming from the local business community and supporters of the local business community. And I just wanna um, say thank you for, for listening to the concerns from that community. Um, and to thank you for all of the work that you are doing. I know it's an unprecedented moment and you are all trying to kind of navigate this um, and put public health first. So I appreciate all of the work that you're doing. Um, I, I'm here obviously on behalf of Portland by Local R400 members um, to ask that you support Councilor Ray and Cook's amendment. Um, uh, I, I, you can't see my face, and so I, I'm a, a little reluctant to bore you with numbers, but um, I'm going to do it a little bit <laughs> anyway. Um, so um, the many of you probably saw that um, the study released over the weekend that said that Maine's economy could be the most severely impacted throughout the in entire country because of the pandemic, and it's due in part to our reliance on tourism our um, aging population and the huge number of small businesses that our economy relies on. Um, and um, many of you have heard me already cite this, the, the numbers that JP Morgan put out a few years ago that on average, um, small retail businesses have only 19 days of cash buffer, which is only three more days than the restaurant community. Um, and obviously we've all understood that restaurants are really in dire straits and ha have rightly um, moved quickly to support them. And I'm very glad that we are doing that. Um, but retailers um, are, are really not that far behind in terms of how, how dire the situation is. Um, so obviously the shutdown is, is gonna be longer, um, has been and will continue to be longer than 19 days. Um, and our one of our members did a, a, an informal kind of survey and found that upwards of a third of small businesses and retailers in particular um, are not getting any sort of assistance from their landlords, um, which is um, a, a pain point for a lot of folks. Um, and so the federal assistance funds um, are really limited in terms of how much the support can go toward their rent. Um, and all of that just to say that um, the, the local business community is part of what really shapes are, um, are the fabric of what makes Portland unique. And so I really appreciate all of you kind of taking the time to listen to the concerns um, and um, appreciate Councillor Thibodeau, um, the amendment that he put forward. I um, appreciate that he was very proactive and kind of reaching out to us. And um, I hope that you'll consider making the, uh, his amendment um, adjusted so that uh, if folks are alone in their in their co-working in their space uh, that they'll they won't have to wear a mask if they're by themselves but certainly understand the need for for masks for essential and non-essential businesses to protect our our public health so thank you so much thank you too thanks for being here uh, next we have Janet uh, Tibito Yeah, Janet Tibbetot, 266 Woodford Street, Portland, Maine, obviously. Um, a self-employed hair stylist, owner of a small business in District 3. And I'm very confused by the dates because I've heard multiple dates. Um, and I saw on your website that you want to have some kind of a continuity with the state. I couldn't hear about all of what Belinda Ray had said because her voice is low. And um, I've watched all but one briefing with the governor so far. And um, I see that she has no potential date, but I've heard the dates, the 27th of April, the 30th, May 1st, May 15th, and now the 18th. I have 80 people to reschedule. I'm self-employed, like I said, I'm 68 years old and I can't retire. There's five others in my small salon that have the, kind of the same I, potential 
And um, as far as I'm, I've heard from others that are operators in other towns, like in Westbrook and Falmouth, they're planning to reopen on the 1st, or they're otherwise confused. I'm not sure. And I realize the governor has something to say tomorrow, but is there a difference between um, what the governor's saying and how did you come up with the 18th when the governor came up with the end of this month? Because I haven't heard anything different from that. And is there a difference between stay at home versus a state of emergency? Um, other than, uh, I, I don't know, I couldn't really find any good definitions for the state of emergency online. Uh, or is that just another term for stay at home? And will you change the date that Portland has to jive with the state? And my last question is, since I haven't had a stimulus, I haven't had unemployment because they haven't got it implemented for the state of Maine, how do I apply for a property tax abatement for one time? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Janet. I'm going to do my best to quickly answer a couple of your questions and we can certainly follow up. Um, the city of Portland's stay at home order expires today, uh, April 27th, which is why we're looking to extend. And we picked the second meeting date in May, which was just sort of logical to think about our next meeting date. But as has been mentioned here, we do have a meeting next week on Monday the 4th as well. So we can be nimble. The state's stay at home order runs through April 30th. So the two dates of the stay at home orders don't coincide perfectly. We expire today the 27th, the state's order goes through the 30th. Um, like you, we're all watching the governor and looking for new information coming from the state and we'll be as responsive as we can be um, with regard to that. And then the last thing on that front is the civil state of emergency that was declared by the governor um, runs through May 15th. And so, that's different than the stay at home order, but I think that's maybe that additional date that you were thinking of there. Um, as far as the city's abatement process, I know that you can get online and find information about that, but please don't hesitate to email me and I can make sure that you get routed to the right folks. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. And we'll go straight to Steve Scharf. Steve and Scharf at Cumberland Avenue. Um, I uh, wanna, uh, Comment on several things. First, I meant to ask during the public um, non-agenda um, item about the attendance count of today's meeting, and I would be I would like if you could put it at, uh, in the in the so that we can see who's how many are here on a regular basis. So, um, I uh, in terms of the order itself, um, I need a haircut, and I noticed a number of city councilors have uh, well coiffed hair and. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that they're getting services that they shouldn't be getting, because uh, I, uh, so, yeah, so. Um, so I, I would, uh, I'm gonna um, advocate for ending the lockdown um, as soon as possible. Um, and uh, I, I quite frankly would uh, ask you all to vote to, uh, essentially not vote to continue it uh, at tonight's meeting. Uh, but uh, if you do can vote to continue it tonight, um, I uh, oppose Councilor Thibodeau's amendment uh, requiring mask of uh, uh, staff. I think uh, local businesses <clears throat> um, hopefully you're hearing me. Uh, local businesses uh, have the ability to manage their own staff um, and uh, we, we shouldn't be putting further burdens on businesses to determine whether certain staff should be masked and certain staff shouldn't be. Um, and lastly, on the gun shop issue, um, I certainly would support her because as Council uh, Dusan said, but I turned out I was probably wrong and um, local business does such a bad job of marketing that I have no idea even today whether uh, Johnson's hunting supply <clears throat> or Johnson's sporting supply sells guns in Portland or not. And I couldn't find on their website an answer to that. So there may be one business in Portland, there may not be. They uh, certainly advertise guns, but I couldn't even on their website, look up a gun to buy. So um, there, you know, but I would suggest it out because you've done your virtue signaling and uh, it, we, we should be supporting all businesses that we can support. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. And we'll go to Ken Capron. Can you hear me? 
Ken Capron from Forest Avenue. How are you today? Um, I'm curious why the city feels it has to have a separate plan in place uh, when the state has a fairly decent plan to begin with. I would, I would like to encourage all of the councilors to vote to re just rescind this and just go along with what the state has for now. And that way you aren't gonna meet as often and let the state uh, handle the problem. But I, my assumption is that most businesses know how to run their business in a safe way. And then most people are gonna be responsible. Well, there may be a few stragglers who aren't, but I, I don't see that we need to, government needs to step in and, and tell people how to take risks or not. So I'd like to suggest that the council back off. Okay, thank you, Mr. Capron. And uh, the next uh, person that we've got in line here is Kay Seidel. You'll have to unmute yourself. We still don't hear you. Um, you're muted. I think you can do star, is it star nine? Oh, I, I, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yep, if you could give us your name and address and you've got three minutes, that would be great. Yep, Carrie Seidel, I live on 335 Forest Ave. I just want to say to you in the city, please keep the stay at home order in place. I walk on the front line at Walgreens and I feel a lot safer knowing that we have a stay at home order. That's all. Okay, thank you so much for being here. This You're evening. welcome. Uh, next in line, we've got Britt Vitalius. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, it's very nice to see you all. Thank you very much. This is Britt Vitalius, Vitalius Real Estate Group on Congress Street. Um, thank you again so much for all your work. Um, you're deliberating some very difficult issues. Um, I just wanted to be brief and express my support for Councillor Cook's um, amendment on uh, real estate and essential business. I've been following the issue pretty closely and have talked to some of you about it. And it seemed that the intention was to protect tenants in units. And uh, we were about to go back to our industry's realtors and sort of give that guidance. And then we found the FAQ on the city's site, which said that condominiums were prohibited. And so there was a lot of confusion. So I think this is an effort to clarify the issue and I really appreciate it. Um, I'd mentioned that I think as we go forward and look to a path um, to start to lose some things in the future, maybe a scenario where um, tenants units can be shown with permission or something like that. Um, there are some gray areas right now. There is a five unit for sale right now that is completely vacant. That's probably actually okay, but is gonna be outside of this ordinance because this is no units larger than five. So if it's really about the tenants, um, likewise, we've got a building for sale in South Portland with one residential tenant in it. And in South Portland, we're able to show it. The tenant is agreeable, he leaves, we go in, we've got masks, we've got gloves, we don't touch anything and we leave and we wipe down his doorknob. So I do think there are ways to do this and. I support this amendment today, but as we go forward, we should start looking for ways that, you know, we can all sort of get back to, to this in reasonable ways. So um, I think that's all I've got this evening. So thank you all again very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, Bill Weber. Bill, you're muted. You might have to s press star nine or, yep. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Councilor Thibodeau, for offering Amendment 7, which requires masks of uh, service employees. I, I want to emphasize a few points. Uh, we all want a, a safe reopening of our economy, and I don't think we can afford uh, to, to do it um, at, at a, at a non-conservative manner. We know very little about this novel coronavirus. Um, you know, we're learning every day, but we certainly don't know the full effect and how we're going to get to the end of, of this year. Um, I'm a pessimist, uh, and that <laughs> pessimism is based on, uh, well, experience. 
And I, I don't believe that a lot of the uh, uh, robust infrastructure that we need is going to be in place. The testing, the contact tracing, you know, I just, I have very high doubt that that's all going to be in place. So we need to do this in a very deliberate and very conservative fashion. If you've been following uh, Andrew Cuomo's um, uh, presentations uh, every day, he has an analogy where as we start to loosen up on these restrictions, he starts to turn a valve. And as he's turning that valve, he's got several metrics that he, they're gonna be monitoring. Well, first of all, obviously we're not New York State. We can't afford a Mike Bloomberg to, to design a, uh, a contact tracing program for us. So a lot of those metrics, I think we're gonna be flying blind. So again, I think we need to take a very conservative approach. We don't wanna get down the road after we've loosened up and said, you know, I wonder if we had had those masks on that gym or in that hair salon, whether that would have made a difference. So again, I, I, I don't think it's overburdensome of service uh, employees and, and institutions uh, to have masks. I would also uh, emphasize, I think it much makes better sense to have, um, um, have customers also wear masks. Uh, again, not the fancy N95 masks that are reserved for uh, our health workers, but, but simple cloth coverings, I think, would go a long way to protecting everyone, giving everyone some more confidence that we can, we can approach our reopening um, uh, quicker and safer. So I want to thank uh, uh, Councillor Thibodeau, Thibodeau again for offering that amendment. Thank you very much. Oh, well, there we go. Perfect timing. Thanks, Bill. Um, I don't see any other hands up for public comment on this item. Um, so I'm going to turn back to the council and I'm going to close public comment on that item and I'm going to look for a motion. Is there a motion uh, for Order 167? Okay, I think that was Councillor Ali with Councillor Costa as the second. Is that right? Okay. Um, is there any council comment on this item? And again, I think that um, we've got the underlying issue of the extension and then we've got the amendments, which I'd like to take uh, one at a time. So I will look to, um, not, not to resummarize, but um, we've got an amendment that will be made by Councillor Cook. It's amendment, I believe, 2A, which is the revision in our packet. Yes, thank you. I'd like to move amendment uh, 2A, which is amendment 2 as revised, as I sent to all of you this afternoon and is in the packet now. Second. Thank you. I've got a motion um, by Councillor Cook for amendment 2A with a second by Councillor uh, Ray. And do we have any um, council comment on this amendment? Councillor Costa. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to Council Cook for bringing this forward um, and for bringing forth the modified proposal. I think that makes me uh, more comfortable with it and I will support it this evening. Um, I think the point of emphasis here is that uh, this is not for any conversion. This is for a specific conversion um, to a tenant uh, that qualifies for a low income program. Um, and I say that because some of the previous public comment that we've received has, has tried to make the point that there's nothing else you can do if, uh, if you have a short term rental unit right now. Um, and I think as Councillor Cook has tried to make clear and as the language makes clear that that's not actually the case here. You could rent to anyone at any income level. So the incentive here is specifically for low income people that we know are going to be most at risk in this crisis. Um, so I would, uh, I will support that um, at, at some point. Um, I'm just going to flag this because it's not uh, germane to the amendment. Um, but I think it would be helpful to have the um, Corporation Council uh, also summarize the difference between the stay at home orders and the other underlying things, because I think that was a point of confusion 
uh, in the public comment, and it will not be the case that things just go back to normal if the stay at home order expires. So uh, I just flagged that so I don't have to keep raising my hands and, and putting them all through that delay. But uh, I will support this amendment. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Costa. Uh, Councillor Mavidonis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I didn't support this in its original form. I'm open to it uh, much more so in, in this form. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, if this is limited, I believe it would be to 25 uh, conversions who could get a bonus. Um, if I was the 26th, um, would I have any opportunity um, or if I was the 26th and I couldn't um, get the $1,000, uh, would I uh, be able to take any action against the city? I don't know, maybe for Danielle. I... Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe so. We had worked that through with um, my Antor Grossa in my office um, and she felt that the language as proposed was appropriate and uh, consistent with her understanding of the issue. And my second question is this, when the stay at home order or whatever order um, uh, finally lapses, uh, does this uh, language survive or does this go away? Danielle, are you looking to answer? Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm looking up the exact language. Um, to pull it up on my computer if i might it the way corporation council's office drafted it for me it would be for the duration of our order plus 30 days that, that's correct councillor mavidonis and it says it in that second paragraph at the bottom that it would be until 30 days after termination of the proclamation okay thank you thank you councillor mavidonis uh councillor thibodeau uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I too, uh, wasn't super interested in this one at our last meeting, but I think with some of the changes Council Cook has made, I think I can probably support it. I had a little bit of heartburn about um, providing a payment to somebody when um, an existing uh, housing provider says, well, I'm already providing this type of housing. Why aren't I getting a payment? And so I was struggling with that, but the way that I've, I kind of see this is that anyone who's eligible for this program has already paid likely a, sub, a substantial amount um, for their fees for their short-term rentals. And really, um, it, if they do what we ask them to do, as Councilor Cook um, has put forward, um, then we're in some instances just returning what they've um, what they've paid to the city. And I think the the incentive for the purposes of, is a good one. So um, I had the similar question about what would happen at the end of the order. Um, and I think that this is, um, this program in its limited form is a good one. And, um, and I appreciate the spirit with which it was brought forward. Uh, thank you, Councillor Thibodeau, Councillor Ray. Thank you. Um, and I lowered my own hand. Uh, so <laughs> I, I also much prefer this amendment as it has come forward to us tonight. I have one question. I'm wondering if we should say that it's for a uh, conversion of a non-owner occupied short-term rental. I don't know if there's a reason to specify or not, but to me, if it's, if it's a short-term rental that's owner occupied, it might be just a room. And I don't really want someone to get a thousand dollars for renting a room. I'd like it to be a whole unit. I believe my amendment, and I, forgive me for jumping in, Mayor. No, um, I believe the amendment that I sent around this afternoon and got posted late this afternoon specified non-owner occupied. Okay. I realized after uh, the original amendment that that was not clear, and I tried to make that clear. But I will, I will leave it to Corporation Council's office in case I failed in my pursuit. Do, do, you, you're correct, Councillor Cook. The language does indicate um, registration for a non-owner occupied short-term rental unit right in the language in the first paragraph. Okay, thank you. I think I have the old one and not the new one in front of me because I'm looking at the 
pack that I marked up over the weekend. Um, <clears throat> so the only other thing, and I think I, I think I'm going to support this. The only other thing I'm going to throw out there is um, the one-year term. Is that a, that's 365 days? It's not just for the like if someone right now switches, the next year of registration starts on the 1st of January, but this would be a full calendar year, 365 days. Yes. I know, I think that's the intention. I'm just wondering if there's any way that it could be interpreted differently. Mayor, would you like me or Corporation Council? Yeah, Councilor Cook, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I intended to draft this, uh, and I will defer to Danielle in case I failed again, uh, to be that the property owner would have to show evidence of a one-year lease uh, in order to qualify. And so that would be a one-year lease from the date upon qualification, which would have to have been within the time of our emergency proclamation plus 30 days. And so it would be really from a one-year point from that point on. That's correct, Councillor Cook. It says um, in paragraph C that it would be for a minimum of one year. And just as you described it, that's uh, staff's understanding as well and uh, as in terms of how that would uh, be calculated. Okay, then final, final question for me. Is anyone interested in two years? And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make that motion. I'm going to leave that if Council Cook wants to amend it. I'll second it, but I'm just putting it out there. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ray. Uh, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, Councillor Cook, thank you very much for bringing this forward. I will be supporting it, but I was going to ask the same thing that Councillor Ray did ask. If, uh, uh, is it possible for us to make it um, um, uh, two years instead of one year? Uh, because um, when you put someone into, if you rent from someone and then after the year, um, this person says that, well, uh, I want to go back on to short term rentals. So I want you to leave. We are putting this person into a whole different, uh, the person have to go and look for a place or uh, how do we call it? Uh, the burden of moving to another apartment, even if they have one. So if uh, there's the wish to make it or the will to make it two years, I will support that. If not, I will still support uh, um, um, what my colleagues bringing forward. Thank you, Councillor Ali. And we'll go to Councillor Dusan. Hi, I just have a couple of questions. Um, and forgive me, I've not been able to find the draft that we're speaking of. So it may be addressed in the draft, but I've not been able to review it. So hopefully uh, the questions are quick and someone can help me with it. Um, uh, during during the lease of one or two years, um, can the person still can a person be evicted for the um, I think it's six reasons in landlord tenant law um, relating to health and safety and those kind of things. Can a person still be evicted pursuant to those reasons? The, the reasons other than non-payment. Can I look to Corporation Council to answer that question? Um, uh, Councilor Dusan, I believe that would be correct if the requirements of the state law were met. Okay. And secondly, did does the newest draft resolve the issue of giving up the short term? How does the new draft? resolve the issue of giving up the current short-term permit and whether the person has to get back in line. Uh, Councilor Cook, do you want to address that? Thank you. So um, the answer to both Councilor Ali's question about the tenant potentially needing to leave at the end of one year because the person would go back into short-term rental and to Councilor Dusan's question about giving up their place in the short-term rental uh, uh, registrations is uh, they're connected. So in this draft, I um, for this particular amendment, I left the, the um, provision that 
the property owner would give up their short-term rental registration, uh, which means uh, that, uh, to Councillor Ali's question, that the tenant would not be uh, uh, subject to being uh, losing their housing because the unit would go back into the short-term rental uh, market automatically. Uh, but it also means that to Councilor Dusan that if the number of uh, short-term rental registrations was still exceeded, that that unit would have to get back in line. And and I thought long and hard about that issue with this this amendment as opposed to Amendment One, uh, which I uh, set aside essentially. Um, I thought that if we were going to use the city's housing trust fund to incentivize a property owner to move their dwelling unit from lodging into housing and particularly into housing uh, for those who receive uh, some form of um, subsidy, Section 8 or general assistance, or if there are other forms, I'm open to those as well, um, that we wouldn't want that uh, tenant, that family to be looking at losing their housing unit at the end of a year as that unit moved back into short-term housing, uh, given the amount of money that we would have spent out of our housing trust fund. So it was um, it, it was a difficult call, and I can see both sides of it. But that's where I kind of landed with this um, with this amendment. Thank you, Councillor. So, is am I understanding correctly then that these units up to twenty five um, would essentially the the uh, landlord may not choose not to renew a one-year lease. I'm just trying to understand what happens at the end of 12 months. If I, if I go into this housing um, and I have my Section 8 and I have a lease of one year, I'm not, I'm not, quite understanding what happens at the end of the lease and what the party's um, rights are. I, I understand the party's rights would be as they are under state law. Um, however, the property owner would have given up their short, their non-owner occupied short-term rental registration. And if we were still at the maximum of those allotments, they would not be able to immediately go back into the short-term rental market. They would have to reapply for a license. And if there were room, they could go back into that. But if there were not room, they would not be able to go back into that, in which case they could rent either to the current tenant or to a new tenant uh, as required and under all the laws that apply under state law. Great. I just want to be sure that we articulate that, that this isn't a guarantee of a lease renewal. Um, the parties still have to have a willing lessor and a willing lessee um, to extend the to extend the lease. Or if they don't extend the lease, then it converts to a 30 day at will pursuant to state law. Um, OK, I understand. I. I, uh, I'm not sure if anyone is going to offer the two year, um, but I, I have similar questions about the two year. Does that mean a two year lease? Um, and it, it, well, I suppose a two year is gonna, it's gonna make it even less likely that we get some folks to convert. So that's the kind of push pull. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in uh, moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Dusan. Um, Councillor Chong. Well, I just want to thank Councillor Cook for thinking this through. And this is a great idea. And I, I really like the spirit of it. Um, but my question is, if I am a short-term rental owner and I decide to um, take the thousand dollar rebate and rent to low income renters, then I'm out of the pool uh, for Airbnb rentals. If I choose not to, and I want to rent to other renters, do I have to I then give up my Airbnb license when that is up? Or is that, are, are the rules the same or are they different for 
two different income levels, one for low income and one for regular income. It's different in a good way. Sorry, I just had a little <laughs> personal interruption here. Uh, Councilor Cook, did you want to reply to that? Sure. So uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Chong. Amendment two does not uh, deal with market rate rentals. And so to the extent um, a property owner with short, a short-term rental registration, uh, would like to uh, either already has, and there are, I think we heard from licensing and inspection staff, there were about 30 or so who have both short-term rental and long-term rental registrations. That was during our housing committee meeting. If I'm going to look to my fellow housing committee members, if I've got that number about right, mm -hmm. um, they already have both um, because there was a number of property owners who rent uh, short-term in the summer and long-term in the winter, you know, university students, et cetera. Um, or if a short-term rental owner uh, opts to also get uh, under current regulations a long-term rental and rent on the market um, to those, uh, they can continue to do that and keep their short-term rental registration. This amendment only really deals with providing the $1,000 payment um, mm -hmm. to a short-term rental um property owner who would then, uh, who's a non-owner occupied short-term uh, rental uh, property owner who then rents to a tenant who's receiving a section eight or a general assistance subsidy. So essentially trying to take that unit from lodging into the affordable housing uh, market. Thank you. I, I really like the idea. To me, it's almost like a, a taxi medallion. So if you're a taxi driver and you get a medallion, you have the opportunity to, to be a taxi driver, that certificate is worth X amount. So if you are an Airbnb short-term rental owner and you're gonna give that up, essentially you're giving that up for a thousand dollar rebate as opposed to keeping it and and uh, renting it long-term, um, you know, we're valuing that asset at a thousand dollars, which, when the economy does turn, um, it's going to be worth more than that. So I love the thinking. I'm just thinking as far as like a business person, the incentive, you know, is my Airbnb certificate worth a thousand dollars or could it potentially be worth much more than that by doing, you know, a long-term rentals for university students and then short-term rentals in the summer. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if we're going to get applicants. And I know it's a great, it's a great concept, and it's a good pilot project. But I'm just thinking in terms of market forces and the value of that, that Airbnb short-term certificate. And and in my mind, it's worth much more than a thousand dollars. So um, that's, I, I like the spirit of it. So that's that's where I am. Thank you, Councillor Chong. Uh, Councillor Dusan. Oh, I didn't mute myself. Sorry, good thing I didn't start coughing. Um, I um, I just wanted to uh, I wanted to kind of state why this why I've warmed to this, um, and that is because the the incentive is truly targeted for a specific outcome, as Councillor Cook describes it. Um, for a conversion of, for renting a short-term rental to long-term to someone who is receiving Section 8 or GA. Their rent is being paid either by the federal government or by the city through the GA program or the majority of their rent is being paid. Um, so part of the incentive for the the incentives that have been in place all along that uh, people are ignoring um, is that they can be sure their rent's going to get paid um, and that particularly for folks who are placed through the GA program, they come surrounded with services um, that are about helping them if it's a, someone who's been long-term homeless, for example. Um, that new tenant comes with a set of services from the city that's about helping them make that transition to being a renter, 
Um, many times in the early months, if problems arise, the GA staff intercede to try and help resolve problems. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's very narrowly targeted. Um, it's, a, it's a small but I think effective incentive. Um, and it doesn't pull folks into the market who are not, who are not going to behave appropriately. I don't mean the tenants, I mean the landlords. Um, the, the, and the landlord still has the opportunity to do a long-term lease without asking for this incentive by simply paying $25 and getting the long-term permit. Um, so if they have some reason why they don't want to go after this incentive, it's pretty easy for them to move their mark, move their unit, um, in this market where it's such a tart tight market they can just spend $25 and and rent to um, any long-term tenant but if they rent to a low-income long-term tenant they can access this incentive and access the support programs that come with that tenant. Thank you Councilor Dusan. Um, I don't see any other council hands at the moment. I'm going to just jump in and go back to something Councilor Cook that you said earlier on which had to do with expanding the language beyond general assistance in section eight to read um, any rental assistance programs. And um, I got some information today indicating that there are others that would fall into that category where somebody's receiving assistance. And I wonder whether or not you might consider making a tweak to section C um, that would um, replace the language specific to GA in section eight with rental assistance programs. I would, I would be happy to do that. Those are the two that I've heard the most about as a member of the housing committee over the last couple of years. Uh, and I would look to corporation counsel's office to uh, sort of make any refinements around that, essentially looking to um, rental assistance programs that somehow our, our city staff would have, a, you know, a way of recognizing. Um, so, so I would appreciate that. Um, I'm in support of this amendment. Um, I understand that uh, the minimum uh, minimum of one year lease um, could be a stopping point for some people, but I'm okay with it um, because I, I think basically what this is is under the context of our emergency order, can we create an incentives for somebody to convert short term housing into long term housing? And if we're able to do that, I, I don't know the answer to that. But if we're able to do that, knowing that we um, have housing needs generally, but we certainly have them during this pandemic crisis, um, then I think that we've achieved success. And so I appreciate this and I will be um, looking to support it uh, with that, hopefully with that tweak that would allow for other rental assistance programs. Um, okay, I see hands up again from Councillor Dusan. In the spirit of avoiding unintended consequences, um, I think there's great value in this being targeted to uh, specific programs that our GA staff are working closely with. Um, I would want us to find out and be able to describe exactly what those other rental assistance programs are. What other rental assistance programs are we intending to cover? Okay. Um, uh, primarily because I think with only 25 slots, it, we depending on what those programs are, we could pretty quickly dilute the incentive um, before we get our, the clients that we would prioritize into the program. Thank you, Councillor Chong. Um, I really like this idea and I like the fact that it's a kind of a pilot project and, and I, I'm going to support this, um, however, if there's no demand within a month, I'd love for us to kind of move that money to help other people because we know that rental assistance is going to be needed not just for low income, but for a lot of sole proprietors and, and you know, small business owners who are not getting the relief that they need. They might need some help uh, further down the road. Um, as we heard from Mary Alice, a lot of small business owners only have 19 days of cash flow and restaurants 16. So they're going to be people in that realm that may need other types of assistance as well. So for me, it's really about demand. And if there is demand, if we can get one or two, 
then it's a success. If we get more than that, it's, it's a home run. Um, but if we don't see much of a demand, meaning that we actually get somebody to give up their Airbnb certificate and place a low-income person in for $1,000, that's, that's a phenomenal achievement. Um, and, and if we don't, um, then, you know, I don't know if it's a month or two months, but, you know, time of, these, of, of the essence when people need to pay their rent. So um, I'll leave that up to the housing committee and council to figure out those details. But I would, I would love for us to figure out um, the, the demand and, and track it and then make appropriate decisions. Thank you, Councillor Chang. Um, and for me, given the comment of the housing chair, um, if we wanna look into that more uh, deeply, that's fine with me. I'm ready to support this amendment. Councillor Dusan? Yeah, I just wanted to um, remind us um, because I needed to be reminded by the housing committee staff at our last meeting. There's, there's another much larger source um, of rental and I believe mortgage assistance um, that's going to be available to the council uh, to figure out how we want to dispose of it at $1.3 million and additional emergency funds that are coming, I think through a supplement through the CDBG program for which the uh, manager and staff are going to be presenting us with recommendations for how to distribute those funds, I think next week. And the housing committee will have the opportunity to see those recommendations and weigh in uh, to the, when they come to the full council. Um, uh, and so, uh, and that's, we're talking about some portion of $1.3 million. Um, and it's one-time money focused on COVID related outcomes. Um, I think that's an excellent source for us being able to get to anyone who is, um, impacted, whose housing is impacted um, by the COVID uh, program, by the COVID virus. In addition, there's the rent program that the governor has approved uh, being managed through Main State Housing Authority. So I would, I would suggest that we keep this particular uh, extraction of funds from the housing trust fund um, limited to the the uh, specific parameters that we're looking at in this amendment. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no additional council hands up on this particular amendment, I think we're ready to uh, vote on amendment 2A as presented by Councillor Cook. So seeing no objection to that, I'll ask our city clerk to um, call for the vote. Council Dusan. Yes. Council Mavadonis. Yes. Council Cook. Yes. Council Ali. Yes. Council Costa. Yes. Council Ray. Yes. Council Thibodeau. Yes. Council Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Okay, great. So that amendment um, passes unanimously. So we're back to our main motion and we'll look to Councilor Dusan um, who has offered us amendment three this evening. So I, I need the answer to a threshold question, which will tell me what, whether I need to present this amendment at all. Um, I think it's a question to Corporation Council. Is there any service, is there any gun selling service currently operating in the city of Portland? Um, Councilor Dusan, I, I mean, I did uh, a similar uh, Google search, um, not, not an extensive search uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, so I couldn't. As far as you know, the answer is, is still no. On and whether or not they could be classified in that category. Um, I don't believe that that's the case. But um, I don't have uh, any other specific um, evidence to show that there's any gun shops as um, it's an undefined term in the state's order as well. Okay, Daniel, a big you, you, portion you of what you said little. got lost when you froze, yeah. Okay, um, my, I'm sorry, my internet connection's not very great today. 
Um, so I, I did a search online, didn't come up with a lot. Um, a couple of the ones that I was concerned about were like pawn shops um, and hunting stores, but I couldn't put any specific information um, that was on the site that would show that they were even open or operating or had any such uh, um, items in their store. Uh, so I would say um, I, I don't have any definitive evidence or guidance that shows that um, those exist within the city, but um, they could, and I just didn't, I didn't find them. So I guess I will, I will go ahead and offer the amendment. Um, I think that um, I just, I, we've done a lot um, and our, our police department has done a lot in terms of um, gun control policies, um, uh, presence of guns in public meetings or in public buildings um, and a couple of other nuanced uh, policy proposals that we have advocated for uh, in Augusta and beyond. And um, those have all been tied to, specifically tied to public health reasons and um, act shootings and, and the potential for shootings. Um, and the problem is this just kind of hangs out there, not connected to those uh, concerns. And so it, from my perspective, feeds the narrative that our, um, our policy considerations are not tied to uh, actual uh, public health data. I think it's important for as we go through this very contentious fight about doing something about the presence of guns in our public uh, forums and in our schools um, that we tie it to data um, and evidence. And so I think we should probably not have this language, but we're, I'm happy to see what the council wishes to do with it. But I think we should not have this language in our order. Thank you, Councillor Dusan. I'm looking to see if there are any council questions. Oh wait, um, we've got we've, we've so so we have a motion. Councillor Dusan, are you making a motion? Sorry, sorry. I think I just muted myself. Yes, I am making a motion. Please. Okay. So with that, I'll look for a second. Second. Councillor Ray has seconded the motion. So, do we have any council comments or questions on this amendment? Councilor Ray. Yeah, I'll just say, um, I, I think that Councilor Blue sounds right. This probably doesn't belong in the emergency order. I think there was a very, um, I mean, I'll call it kind of a Portland reaction and can include myself among that in saying gunshots aren't essential. Why would those be open? Uh, but I think I often forget because it is not part of my particular cultural experience that guns are used for many reasonable purposes, including, uh, I was looking at hunting seasons because I also thought what could possibly be coming up and there is wild turkey is coming right up. It starts May 2nd, it runs through June 6th. So I think we, I, I don't know that we have any gun shops. Um, I don't think this belongs in our order. I'll support Council Dusan's amendment. And it's by no means saying that I am a, big gun supporter and think we should all go out and buy guns. I'm <laughs> just saying, I don't think this belongs here. And I think um, I was I was reacting last time because I, I generally support gun control and background checks and all those things that I know my constituents do. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm fine with this amendment. I will support it. Thank you, Councilor Ray. Others? Um, seeing none, I just have a quick question um, in the spirit of unintended consequences. If, um, if a pawn shop sells guns and they're considered a non-essential business um, at this point in time, does this language open up uh, pawn shops, for example, which we certainly do have in Portland, and put them into the essential business category? Just curious. That's a question for Corporation Council. Does this put pawn shops into the essential business? Yeah, category? could it? Could it? If if gun shops are considered essential, and the shops in Portland that set, that potentially sell I, them are pawn shops, would it just change that category for that that type, or the, change the designation for that category? 
No, I don't think so. I think I was reading it um, broadly. I keep looking for a definition of that term and I've been unable to find it. Um, but I don't, I don't think that would be the case. Okay, thank you. That's my only question. I don't see any other hands up at this point in time, which is leading me to think we may be ready to vote on this amendment unless I see another hand shoot up. Here we go. Okay, will the city clerk please call the roll for this, the vote on the amendment? Council Dusan. Uh, yes. Council Mavidonis? Yes. Council Cook? Yes. Council Ali? Yes. Council Costa? No. Council Ray? Yes. Council Thibodeau? No. Council Chong? Yes. Mia Snyder? Yes. Okay, that amendment passes seven to two. Thank you very much. Um, and so thank you, Councilor Dusan. We will move over to amendment number. So we're back to the main motion. We're gonna to look to um, Councilor Ray for amendment number four. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, actually I'll move it first. I'll move amendment four. Great, second. do we have a second? second. <laughs> There's a second. And then I will just speak, I think briefly to it. People probably completely understand this. Uh, currently our local version of uh, essential services does not allow any kind of construction except for things that have a permit in hand um, as of March 25th. So I said before that, that the date didn't make sense to me because it has nothing to do really with whether or not a project allows social distancing, how big it is, what the scope of the project is, what the kind of work is, doesn't matter if it's a vacant unit or not. Um, so I found the date to be very arbitrary. I also looked at our FAQs and realized that, um, which I hadn't understood before, that we also, by this language, are not permitting any construction that doesn't require a permit. So this means that basic home repair is not allowed. Um, and I certainly would welcome a, a correction from Corporation Council, but when I read the FAQs, that's what it says. If your work doesn't require a permit, it's not allowed, it doesn't matter. So that means, for instance, that the house fire that happened on Stevens Avenue, nothing can be done to repair that. Um, even whether it needs a permit or doesn't need a permit, you can't do anything about that in Portland right now because we've prohibited all construction unless you had a permit on March 25th. It means that let's say you have a leaky toilet and you can get a plumber to come in because they're essential, but all they can do is reset your toilet on rotting floorboards. You can't have the floorboards replaced because there's no construction allowed. Um, so I think there are some unintended consequences here. And I, would, I just think it makes sense for us to align with the state on this. So that's what I did scratched out hours and added construction back in to the essential services list. So if anyone has questions, I will answer them, but I think probably pretty straightforward. Thank you, Councilor Ray. Do I have any questions or comments from the council? Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to Councilor Ray for bringing this forward. Um, I thought I'd just share my thinking on it. I plan to support this amendment. Um, and the reason I support it is that um, from a public health standpoint and a work site standpoint, if construction can be done with physical distancing and, and the other requirements uh, for workplaces with a permit held before March 25th, it seems to me that it can be done with a permit held on March 20, you know, issued on March 26th or thereafter. And so the date for me seemed somewhat arbitrary as far as um, the type of um, service uh, that was being provided and whether it can be done in a way that uh, still promotes public health and preserves public health. And so um, I would also prefer for us uh, in this realm to align uh, with the state. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor Costa. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you to Councillor Ray for bringing this forward. Um, we've obviously discussed most of these issues multiple times. Um, for me, uh, th this is one that I don't intend to support 
this evening, um, but I will identify that uh, I'm getting closer and closer to supporting it. Um, this is the type of thing where we're going to have to reevaluate on a weekly kind of basis. Um, and without being premature, I, I think we're starting to feel like we see uh, some proverbial light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. Um, we're not at the end of the tunnel. We're not that close to the end of the tunnel, um, but we can start to see the contours of how we, we rebound on this. Um, and it may be in the next week or two uh, that I'm, I'm ready to support loosening up the restrictions. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna uh, stick with the, the rule that we've had in place. Thank you, Councillor Costa. Uh, back to Councillor Ray. Well, quickly, sorry, I should have I should have waited. I just forgot to mention that the Department of Labor, the main Department of Labor, does have a four-page guidance um, for construction in terms of how to operate and suggestions about social distancing and all of that stuff. So, so there is also guidance that um, have to be followed, and the construction would also have to follow all the essential business requirements that are in the governor's order. Thank you, Councillor Ray. Uh, Councillor Chong. Um, manufacturing is considered essential and in many ways the way I see construction, it is manufacturing. It just happens to be more in an outdoor space as opposed to in a confined space. Um, and the governor does allow people to uh, to emergency repairs, whether it's plumbers, or electricians. And so there is some guidance there. Um, it just, there's just so many gray areas. Um, you know, it, what is, is essentially, is essential and what is considered manufacturing and construction, all this other stuff. So, um, but in, you know, if there are specific strict guidelines like the real estate and 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 from what Councillor Ray is saying about DOL and construction guidelines, and if they adhere to those things where um, you're in an industry where construction has a lot of regulations like OSHA rules as opposed to other places that may not necessarily have as many regulations such as selling condominiums. You don't necessarily have OSHA rules to follow. and and whereas uh, construction workers do. But then there's the other piece of what what is construction? Is it from lead abatement to uh, deck repair to um, you know a 20 story building or, or whatever? So um, that's where it gets really squishy and, and um, difficult to kind of confine because you know construction is so broad and so big um, that you know, I, I would like to see more clarification as to, you know, you know, is it maybe for me, I would feel more comfortable if it was X number of people per, you know, site or per construction site. Um, and, um, and that, that makes it easier for me to swallow as opposed to this is going to be all construction and you know, and, and also the other piece is, you know, is it going to be more refined work? Is it going to be construction that's necessary to move from one phase to the second phase? Or is it more finished work construction where you go into someone's house um, and and they're not there or, or they are there? Those kind of things that are really, it's just so broad. I would I would love for us to kind of get more details around it but I like the spirit of it. Um, you know, it just, it's almost like saying, let's open up an entire sector without really teasing out how it will affect all the different pieces from a one person construction company to, you know, a, a thousand person construction company. It just, it's, it's a simple sentence that affects all those people. Um, so that, that's, that's where I am now. So I'm just gonna listen a little bit more, but I just wanted to let you know that I, I like the spirit of it, but it's just, it, it's confusing because there are just, there's just so many different parts to construction. Um, and 
I would I wish there was more guidance from the state to say within construction, these are things that we can allow and these things we can't because we want to have safe distancing and and um, you know safe standards. Thank you, Councillor Chong. Councillor Ray. Um, so I do just want to say that the essential businesses, and I was trying to bring up the governor's order. I don't have it right in front of me, but it does have all of that stuff in it about how you can continue these things, provided you're keeping the six foot distance and um, not gathering any more than necessary. And they also, in the, in the DOL, document, it says uh, things that you should do is you should stagger trade work and work shifts. So if you have some contractors coming in, stagger them so they're not visiting the site at the same time. Limit work to tasks that are strictly necessary with the goal of maintaining distance. Um, employers may need to schedule multiple smaller meetings for crews, including safety meetings, trainings, rest, lunch breaks, with no more than 10 staff at any one, more time, any one time in one location. Hold meetings outdoors, prohibit large gatherings, establish a social distance monitor. So they, they do have all of these things as um, ways to social distance on a construction site. So I do just want to make you aware of that. It even goes down to use stairs instead of lifts or hoists when possible. It needs to minimize surfaces and and and, and two-person things. Um, yeah, so so that is an and and have taps and washing facilities on site. Make sure you're sterilizing things that are common areas and common touch points, including your tools. So there is a lot of that in there, and that would probably be very good for us to make uh, make sure construction companies are aware of on the MDOL website. Thank you, Councillor Ray. Uh, Councillor Mavadonis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm leaning towards supporting this. Um, I, you know, I have some concerns, and it's not specific to this, um, and 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 it's a concern I have, you know, with uh, um, a later portion of our agenda. Um, is how does any of this get enforced? And I understand that. Most businesses are, are good and follow the rules. Um, and, I, and I think sometimes there's a lack of clarity. Um, you know, I know several businesses that um, have, have another part of the agenda, but have not been um, uh, working because they were following the city's uh, order. And then many others, uh, and perhaps it was the, our own fault or uh, some loss of translation, um, were working, even though it was in violation of the city or perhaps the state's order. And, you know, that again, that may be uh, a misunderstanding, but um, people push the envelope and they're, right now people are, are very concerned um, that their business are gonna survive. So I do have generally an overall concern um, and it's, not just specific to this item, uh, about how we get people to know what the rules are and how we get them to follow them. Um, because we still have a, a significant potential uh, health issue um, before us. And uh, I think most businesses can, can follow uh, physical distancing rules and and uh, face coverings were needed and a whole host of other things. However, um, and I haven't got on the phone and called the city or anybody, but I've seen plenty of construction crews working in the city in the last few weeks. Um, that, and I know masks aren't required, but people are two or three feet from each other. And they're not following physical distancing. So, um, and these are people that are allowed to be working right now. So I, I you know, I think, I think we need to think about how we're going to ensure that that um, the message gets out, and we can't have people telling us I didn't understand the rules. Um, and that may be separate from this. Like I said, I'm leaning towards supporting this, but but the, I have concerns about um, 
people following the rules. And if they don't follow the rules in this case, or they haven't been following the rules and somebody is infected, um, you know, it, it may spread much more quickly. So like I said, I'm leaning towards this. I'd like to hear if any others have thoughts, um, but those are some concerns that I have in general. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dusan. Uh, what makes me lean towards this is the notion that the city's rule in this context would be the same as the governor's order. And the reason I am uh, attracted to that is that once again, the governor stated in her briefing today that uh, she intends to fully enforce her order, which to me says that on the enforcement side, it changes the position of the employee who is in this work situation and the employer is not following the distancing rules because the employee then has some place to complain. The Department of Labor is accustomed to responding to employee complaints um, they, um, and preserving the confidentiality of the employee when they look into a workplace uh, situation. Um, and so I'm, I'm attracted for that reason to this language because it incorporates, it, it's, makes, it conforms our process to the governor's and it incorporates, by doing that, incorporates the Department of Labor guidance and all of the language that's included in the governor's order. Um, the piece that still pushes me back the other direction is that we we didn't establish these rules um, to, to punish someone? Um, these were these were rules based on evidence that the there was a that Portland or Cumberland County, if there was any hot spot in Maine, it seemed to be Southern Maine, um, and we were in the position of putting our order in place prior to the governor doing her order. We're in that position again, given that our order expires prior to the governor's order expiring. And we haven't, we don't in this conversation have the benefit of the governor's announcement tomorrow as to what she's gonna do with her order. And I, I think um, once we knew what she was gonna do with her order, it, can really, it could really help with our discussion as to what narrow areas we believe based on evidence um, and the desire to protect uh, residents of Southern Maine where there have been more cases, um, what are those narrow areas where we think our, our rules need to be more stringent than the states? So I'm back and forth on that, um, but I am uh, tempted by this particular language or this change because it provides an enforcement opportunity for employees who may be in a situation where they don't have a bargaining position with the with the with the uh, boss, but if they're being put in a situation where they're not provided with the right equipment to, uh, you know, mask if it if it's a whatever, um, if they're put in a situation that's not consistent with the state guidance, they have somewhere to go um, to get compliance. Thank you, Councillor Dusan. Um, I'm going to jump in and just um, say that I will be supporting this amendment this evening. I'm comfortable aligning um, with the state's order on this issue at this point in time. And I appreciate that when we first started taking up these conversations on March 25th and on March 30th, um, the context was different. We didn't know where we were going um, in terms of time. Here we are about a month later, and we do have some experience under our belts in terms of what that construction cutoff time meant when it, when it was established and maybe what it looks like now. Um, and so for me, I'm comfortable aligning with the state's guidance on this issue. Um, I do think that Portland's density and um, we have some considerations that are different than other communities in Maine, but when it comes to construction, 
Um, I don't see huge differences whether you live in Portland or some other town in Cumberland County or Augusta for that matter. Um, and so I feel like this is just one of those pivot points um, that Councillor Costa refers to in terms of making our way along the path and assessing the information that we've got at various times. And so I don't think I would have been here two weeks ago, um, but I am here now in terms of supporting this amendment and allowing our emergency stay at home order to reflect the guidance from the state with regard to construction. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I do see a hand from Councillor Chong. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, there we go. There you go. I just wanted to public to know why I was divided um, because one, the median age of construction workers is over 50. And two, most of the construction workers um, are men. And we know that COVID-19 affects um, people over 50 and, and mostly uh, elderly men. And we know that Portland has the highest concentration of COVID cases and many construction workers commute to Portland to work and then go back to their home. Not many of them actually live here. They actually live outside of Portland. So, you know, it's those things in addition to fairness, right? It is manufacturing and other manufacturing sectors are open. Um, and people need to to work, and a lot of construction workers, many of them are independent contractors, and they're not getting the kind of relief they they could be getting because they're you know um, sole proprietors. So it's this complicated dance that we have to figure out. It's not just about opening up the construction sector. It's about are we creating this domino effect that could hurt rural Maine as much as it can hurt Portland. And at the same time, people need to make a living and, and they need to survive. So <laughs> that's why, you know, it sounds so conflicted. It's, it's the most complicated calculus thinking that we've all of us had to go through. So um, it's not just about following state guidelines. It's more complex than that for me, at least. And so I like the idea that we have enforcement. I like the idea that there's a place to turn to. And where I land is it's, you know, I, I'm more inclined to support larger construction projects as opposed to smaller ones. Um, but, but then again, the smaller ones need the money more than larger ones because they're mostly sole proprietors. So um, that's, I just wanted the public to know, like this is way more, this is the most complex thing that we've ever had to deal with. Um, but uh, I'm inclined to support this simply because there's going to be some enforcement um, and that we will be more in line with the state and hopefully we'll have more guidance and clearer language from the state and better leadership uh, around these issues from the state for us to get behind. Thank you, Councillor Chong. I just want to um, pipe in here just for a second and turn to the city clerk. I know that there may be issues with councillors reaching the 10-minute li limit. So Kathy, do you want to give us any updates? Um, yes. Um, so Councilor Dusan and Councilor Chong are both out of time. <laughs> so um, Councilor, do you want me to give how much time everybody has left? Sure. I move an mind. extension for all councilors. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Councilor, yeah, Councilor Costa has seven minutes and 36 seconds. Mav Council Mavadonis has six minutes and nine minutes, six sec nine seconds. Council Thibodeau has eight minutes. Um, Council Ray has uh, five minutes and 37 seconds. Um, Council Ali has nine minutes. Um, Council Dusan is out. Council Chong is out. And Council Snyder, uh, Mayor Snyder has eight minutes. And Council Cook has five. Thank you very much. <laughs> so. Welcome. I appreciate you doing that for us. Um, okay, so we are back at the amendment and I've got Councillor Ali who has plenty of time. I know, I, for the first time, I'm the most conservative individual on the council. I have more time than anyone else. Uh, if you need my time, please text me and we can negotiate a deal. Um, I have a question. Um, in terms of uh, asking uh, construction workers to 
practice the social distancing, are we asking them to put on face covering as well? Council Ray, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, there is not a requirement um, for face coverings unless it's required by the work. And a lot of construction work does require a respirator, for instance. And a lot of times people do wear masks anyway, simply to keep debris from getting in their faces. But the state does not have uh, a requirement for, and, and nor do we at this point in time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Okay, I do not see any other hands at this point in time, and I'm inclined to move us to a vote on this particular amendment. Um, okay, so uh, will the clerk please call for this vote? Kathy, you're muted. So yeah, Councillor Dusan? Yes. Councillor Mavadonis? Yes. Councillor Cook? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? No. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. And Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We're back. We're back to our um, our order as amended at this point in time, and we're going to hop to uh, Amendment 5, which was brought forward by both Councillors Cook and Councillor Ray. Um, and this de definitely has some grounding um, from our workshop um, last week. So thank you both for bringing this forward. And I'll leave it to you um, to offer a motion. Oh, I will move this amendment. Second. Great. We've got a, a, a motion by Councillor Ray and a second by Councillor Cook. And if either of you would like to speak to the amendment before we take Council comment, um, we'd be happy to hear from you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start and then Council Foot can add anything um, that I missed. So essentially this will align the city of Portland with the state order on non-essential businesses. It will still require that non-essential businesses remain closed, that they do not welcome the public in their spaces. Um, and but what it will allow is for them to do things like shipping and delivery and the state also does allow curbside pickup so those things would all be okay it is very clear that this is continues to be tied to the state um, that social distancing requirements have to be implemented that you have to have the fewest number of employees possible on premises when conducting such services that there is no customer vendor or other visitor in-person contact, um, that anything that's happening is facilitated to the maximum extent practicable by employees working remotely, and that businesses follow the most up-to-date version of the CDC's guidelines for businesses and employees with regard to planning and responding to coronavirus disease 2019. So um, all of those things are in there. And uh, I mean, I think that's it, unless I missed something. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to Councillor Ray for being a leader on this issue um, over the last uh, several weeks. I would just add um, that, yes, uh, we were trying to align uh, with the state on non-essential business operations. And I would just give an anecdote of why I think it's important that we align on these purposes. Um, if you all remember back on March 30th, uh, one of the businesses that had been in touch with many of us was a fabric store, Z Fabrics, um, and concerned about being able to fulfill fabric orders uh, remote, you know, with no contact delivery of some sort. Since then, one of our the state guidance from our Department of Economic and Community Development is actually encouraging fabric stores to do curbside uh, pickup, no contact curbside pickup, because of the need for fabric for people to make their own uh, face masks at home. And um, I, I provide that as I was uh, sort of looking into things last week and collaborating with Councilor Ray on this amendment, I came across that um, update from our state 
DECD. And I thought it sort of spoke volumes to me as to um, how it can be a benefit to continue to align in some aspects with the state guidance as they're able to um, issue updates on a daily basis, sometimes from commissioners um, as to uh, as things change. So um, anyway, thank you to Councillor Ray um, for uh, her leadership on this and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, Councillor Costa. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll be quick because we've discussed this uh, in depth at multiple meetings. Um, I'm ready to support this this evening. Um, and I would just emphasize the points that Councillor uh, Ray laid out when she introduced this um, in terms of how stringent the restrictions continue to be on uh, businesses that are operating. Um, but again, I, I think we're nearing the point where uh, people can see that we are going to start at least with baby steps uh, to be looking at how we begin to uh, move into a stage of some level of, of reopening the economy. Um, and given that and our experience uh, over the last several weeks, I, I think that it makes sense for us to um, look at the category where there's likely to be the most questions, which is what can you do, particularly if you're a non-essential business, um, and align ourselves uh, with the state's uh, thinking on that. They do have the uh, biggest proverbial megaphone and they do have the greatest enforcement ability as well. So uh, I wasn't there not that long ago, but uh, the facts on the ground are changing and I think this makes sense at this time. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Costa. Uh, Councillor Dusan. You're muted. I raised my hand with a question. Um, I, I didn't know if I should call on you or not. Right, I know. I, I don't get what this means in terms of entering the premise that the question that's been posed to us in a cup in a series of emails. I understand curbside means you pick up from the curb. Um, I hope maybe it means you don't get out of your car when you pick up. But what does this mean in terms of picking up a takeout order by entering the premises of the business? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Councilor Dusan, the, the, in terms of restaurants, that's governed by a different order of the governors. And so I don't think that this amendment would address that issue at all. It's um, governed by like order uh, 14, I think. So that's a separate issue. And that would still be governed by that order. So I would just say the example of the fabric shop. <clears throat> right. The so fabric saying, shop would be different. That would, uh, yeah, that would address this. And so do I go in the fat? Can no. I go in the fabric shop to get my fabric? No, even though cannot. I stay six feet away from everybody. No. Or is it literally curbside? Is it outside the business? Councilor Ray is saying yes, it is outside of the business. Of the, yes, you, am I muted? Am I? Here, no, I hear I'm you. Okay. So, so is yes. that is that in? I I was hoping to follow uh, Councilor Cook's guidance, and she thought it was outlined in the governor's order. It's it's right in hours too. So in okay. hours it says um, that they all all these businesses that do not provide the essential services have to close their physical workspaces and facilities to workers, customers, and the public. Uh, but you can continue to operate through remote means that do not require workers, customers, or the public to enter or appear at the brick and mortar. Excellent. Um, Excellent. I but will. then it just allows them to go in to do like inventory and prepare the deliveries and that kind of stuff that the public cannot go in at Okay, I have a little short list of people I'm gonna send that to. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Dusan. Uh, uh, I've got Councillor Costa. Your hand is—is is it up again, or is it? It was never lowered. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Mavadonis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had some thoughts uh, and maybe a question or two. Um, I guess my first question, and, and, and I think Councillor Dusan alluded to it or discussed it, but um, in terms of enforcement, I still come back, and perhaps I need to get over it. 
but I still come back to the fact that for weeks we had people who were unclear on our order. And those folks who were unclear for whatever reason were operating in violation of the order. One can uh, agree or disagree on whether it was a good order in the first place. Um, and I don't know if this is for John or for, for Danielle, but um, how is this going to be enforced? It's all well and good to say that people aren't going to do things that they're not supposed to do in the order. Um, but we have people who need revenue um, and without that revenue, their business, and we've heard this over and over again, may not be able to, to come back from this. So how are we going to enforce um this 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 change this order. um who would like uh, to answer that I, I can speak to that mayor if it's okay of course yes thank you um so as as we all know we have a, a fairly robust inspections process right now during COVID 19 it's been scaled back some but we still have some inspections that are going on um some most of it virtually where we're, we have people send us videos or um, you know, we're, we're able to do it that way. Um, honestly, um, the only way we really can do any real enforcement if we open up the entire city uh, to all construction will be, the, uh, will be re uh, reports. Uh, and then of course, we'll, we will get people, I mean, all of us get a lot of emails uh, reporting others. And so this will just be another list of uh, reports that we'll have to investigate. But just like I've said before, um, there's a lot that's being put on city staff from an enforcement perspective. Um, and I'm, um, I just don't want to give anybody the belief that we'll be out at every ins uh, construction site inspecting everything that they're doing uh, outside of the site plan and and so forth. And, and John, is that the same for businesses that, uh, if this passes, are able to um, ship things or have uh, 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 pick up at the door type sales, um, but they can't fabricate and do things inside the business, if I understand it correctly? And would that be the same type of enforcement? Similar in that it's complaint based. You know, I received a lot of emails over the weekend about th this business or that business not having a person looking, um, restricting the numbers coming into the building. And so what we try to do is we try to respond to those complaints to the best of our ability. And, and I appreciate that. And, and, and my feeling is that, and I think we all agree that every business really wants to comply with the, with the regulations. Mm -hmm. um, however, I keep coming back to the fact that we had a lot that weren't, and some of that may have been a communication issue. Um, would we do, uh, update or somehow do another um, frequently asked questions around this? Because it seems to me that would be very important for us to be clear about what people can and can't do. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Councillor, I would disagree probably with you um, on the initial point that every business um, is willing to um, to adhere to all of the guidelines and the restrictions that have been in place. We certainly know that hasn't been the case, um, and we've had to uh, do measures of enforcement uh, with some, but um, I think uh, I think we'll just have to take this on a case by case basis, and we can update the FAQs. But uh, again, we just want to make sure that that doesn't. Um, well, we certainly will be after the the air actions tonight. We'll be certainly be updating it based upon what you've already done. So we we will be doing that as well. Well, if thank you, and and um, and I think we have to be prepared when we get complaints because somebody thought they heard something tonight and the frequently asked question says that that's not exactly what it is, or if we get complaints from uh, constituents uh, about enforcement, um, I think we need to make sure we're, uh, you know, just willing and ready to, to deal with those. Um, you know, I think, I think everybody um, who, 
who's I'm looking, everybody I'm looking at on the screen tonight um, and, and the, the staff are all leaders in trying to deal with this issue. Um, it's, a, it's a balancing act and we're seeing it all around the country. We're seeing it all around the state. Um, it's how, you, how one is weighing the uh, health and data from scientists and doctors against the economic issues that are realities for the economy and for, for businesses and actual people and employees. So I think everybody is trying to struggle through that. Um, different people come down on different ends of that spectrum. I don't think there's a right or a wrong. I think people fall somewhere along that. Um, you know, I think we need to be measured in how we're opening up the city. Um, I'm not sure that this is um, an unmeasured way to do this. Um, you know, like I said, enforcement is, is a concern for me. Portland is much different, and Councilor Duson, I think, mentioned this earlier. We are much different than the rest of the state. Um, whether it, it, the density of our businesses, the types of our businesses, uh, the last item around construction, there's nowhere else in the state that you can go and see the type of construction going on, um, or at least you could before the pandemic hit. Um, so I think we have to be realistic about the fact that Portland is different than the rest of the state. So I'm, I'm not as interested in, in trying to align with something that is designed uh, for um, uh, St. Agath as, as, as much as it is for Bangor um, or other communities. I think we have to do what's right for Portland. If we think this is the right next step for Portland, um, then I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I do think we need to support staff because we have, um, we undoubtedly will, will hear from people who didn't quite understand what was being proposed tonight. Um, and I think we need to be supportive of, of our staff once we've made this decision, if we do go forward tonight. Um, I'm gonna support this. I have some trepidation um, for the reasons that I've laid out around um, enforcement. And um, you know, I think there will be businesses that are, I, I think it's, it's going to be challenging for some businesses um, uh, to, to stick with, with these rules, but I think we have to be, um, we have to understand that the great majority are going to try to do that and um, move forward with that understanding. So my time's probably up, so I will wrap up and say, um, with some reservation, I'm going to I'm going to support this tonight. Thank you, Councillor. Um, okay, I'm going back over to the list. We've got uh, Councillor Costa, Ray, and then Cook. So my my hand should be down there. Oh, okay. It was up. Um, I've got Councillor Ray next and then Councillor Cook after that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that in terms of compliance, I really do think that the vast majority of people that weren't complying did not understand the limitations that we placed. And I think that's supported by the amount of email we got once they did understand, once that FAQ went out, people, people reacted quickly. So I think that does speak to the fact that a lot of folks didn't understand that it was that restrictive. Um, and I, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because when I, I think you probably all had this experience when you get together with friends and you talk about things that are going on in the city, you realize not everyone's following this. <laughs> like, not everyone is invested in all these decisions as invested as we are. And so I just want to put a plug in for the FAQs because I really do think they've been incredibly helpful. It's very hard for people to follow this, to sit here for whatever we're going on four hours now, to sit here and, and if you're not, you know, used to watching a council meeting, it's really hard to figure out even what's been decided once a vote is taken sometimes. So I, I would say, yes, absolutely keep the FAQs coming. The state's been great about putting things up to explain their orders. And um, I think that's the best way for us to get as much voluntary compliance as possible. And to the city, to staff, to, to the city manager Jennings, um, I completely understand that you can't be everywhere at all times, watching everyone, enforcing everything, that things need to be complaint-based. And I, I do think that when we're clear, I really do think we will get a majority of voluntary compliance with with these things. So that's, that's all. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Ray. Councillor Cook. Thank you. I just wanted to add that I think the compliance and enforcement issue will be made much easier when in the places where we align with the state. And both because it's more clear um, to the regulated community and to the public what our rules are. And so I want to be extra special clear, mm -hmm. um, hopefully an intent in case we didn't get the language exactly right, that the intent on this amendment is to align with the state standards for non-essential businesses. Uh, and so as staff puts together a FAQ about this, that that's the guidance to, uh, to businesses. But also as complaints come in, I hope that we can refer them to the state because that at the end of the day, they are uh, the enforcement entity as well. And where we have different regulations, that's on us. But to the extent that we have the same regulations, that goes up to their responsibility and I think we should rely on them. And so that's what I would say about how do we enforce and regulate. I think we should really rely on our on the state where we can and align where we can. And when we can't and we have a, a real reason for wanting to have a different rule, then we need to be clear about that. We need to communicate it and we should have the responsibility to enforce it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, I'll, I'll weigh in here just to let, um, let my colleagues know that I will be voting in support of this amendment this evening. Um, I think that we have found our way here through a variety of actions in terms of um, a press release issued a week ago Friday, a council workshop on Monday the 20th with robust discussion, lots of interaction with the community, both people who own small businesses um, but also people who are looking to those small businesses to fill needs. Um, I do think that we also learned a lot through communications with the state in terms of what the state is allowing and what they're providing for guidance to, let's say, a bookstore in South Portland versus what we were um, allowing here in Portland. And so I've made my way to um, this point this evening where I'll vote for this change to our local stay-at-home order. Um, we're, I'm certainly seeing a theme here tonight in terms of aligning more closely with the state on certain things. Um, I do believe that there is some benefit to having the guidance and the um, uh, sort of the rules laid out by the state and being able to go to the state for clarification and to be part of a big community of towns and cities that are doing just that. Um, like many of you, I share um, concern about the enforcement piece um, because staff is um, already stretched and they can't enforce everything. These are very unusual times. And so this leads me to say that whether it's compliance with non-essential business, you know, curbside delivery and mail, um, or it's people walking on the back cove, we rely a lot on personal responsibility. And we all know that we get tons of emails from people who have concerns in a variety of ways. And a lot of those concerns are because there's a perception that others may be not complying or, or may not be complying. And so as we make our way through these decisions, um, a lot of what we're doing, in my opinion, is we're messaging to the community where we are in terms of a city's response to um, stemming the spread of this virus while also recognizing a month or so in that our local small businesses are so important to all of us, to our local economy, and um, to, to what Portland is. And so working together to communicate about where we are in terms of any of these matters um, within our stay-at-home order, how they're impacting people, and again, just sort of the open-mindedness to pivot when needed. We're, we, are, we clearly are making changes. Um, every time we come back to our stay at home order. And so um, I look at this amendment before us this evening, along with many others tonight, and I say, we're just in a different place right now than we were at a different moment in time. So um, I'm, I'm content to support this tonight. And I wanna thank both Councillor Ray and Councillor Cook for bringing it forward. And if I don't see additional council hands, which at this point I don't, I'm gonna to turn to vote on this amendment, amendment number five, and I'll ask the city clerk um, to call the roll for this vote. Council Dusan. 
Yes. Council Mavidonis. Council Mavidonis, do you, are you voting? <laughs> You're on mute now. Are you, you're muted now. Oh. Okay. I thought I had said yes. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Council Cook. Yes. Council Ali. Yes. Council Costa. Yes. Council Ray. Yes. Council Thibodeau. Yes. Council Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Okay. That passes unanimously. We're back to the main motion, order 167, and we'll go straight over to Councillor Cook for amendment number six, having to do with real estate. Thank you. I described it earlier. Uh, I'd be happy to again if people need a reminder, but otherwise I would just move passage. And is there a second? I think I have Councillor Ray with a second. Okay. We've, We've, we've got a, for a motion and a second on this amendment um, having to do with a slight clarif clarification and expansion within the real estate um, component of our stay at home order. Is there any council comment on this item? This is what happens after four hours <laughs> and it's a clean amendment, so thank you. I don't see any council comment or questions, so I'll ask the clerk to uh, call the roll for this vote as well. Councilor Dusan. Yes. Councilor Mavidonis. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <Cook? laughs> yes. Councilor Ali. Yes. Councilor Costa. Yes. Council Ray. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau. Yes. Council Chong. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. Okay, thank you again. So we are back at order 167 as amended by our um, previous amendments. And we are heading into our last offered amendment this evening, which um, is before us from Councillor Thibodeau this evening. Yep, um, I've explained it. Um, so let's get to talking. Okay, do you wanna make a motion Councillor Thibodeau? Oh yes, that's a good idea. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I move that uh, we pass this amendment. Second. Actually, do I have to move it as, I'm sorry, do I have to, if it has an effective date of April 30th, do I have to move it as any sort of an emergency? Okay, good, thank you. Okay. All right, so we've got a motion by Councilor Thibodeau, a second by Councilor Mavidonis, and I suspect we will have some um, council comment or questions on this one. Councilor Chong. Oh wait, you're out of time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get to speak doesn't get to speak then what what do we do in that situation i have not encountered this before in the past i'll move to i'll extend, move to give him extension all right extension all right. of three minutes or whatever you need all right i think you should do word counts as opposed to act <laughs> yeah you have lucky minutes. like i'm not southern i have a long drawl and and more pauses um so my my question is it, that Wait, was, was I, I was was I seconding three minutes? Are we doing that? Is that's that what I mean? said, but I don't yes. know what. I will second. Okay, all in all favor of giving Councillor Chung three <laughs> more minutes. That's three more minutes. We can just right. go like that. Okay. We need a roll okay. call. Do we that need a roll call? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Quick. No. Okay. Councillor Dusan has been muffled. <laughs> okay. So Councilor my Dusan. question is. Um, and I got I got a question from a constituent. It's a, it's a good one. And so we we give exceptions to people who might have uh, health and safety concerns for not wearing a mask. But what if it's an occupational healthy concern? So let's say you're working at a restaurant and you're over a, a fire and it's really hot. Do you have to wear it, or is that also exempt? Am I am I allowed to answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that actually was part of the impetus, especially for, I, I got that question as well. That was part of the impetus for the additional language with respect to somebody who doesn't interact with the public or can maintain that six feet of space from another employee shouldn't be required to wear a face covering. And I think, I think that probably gets us there. Um, that also pertains to folks who maybe are in their shop by themselves or they're in a room 
in the same building as another employee and they have no interaction. So it just provides a little bit more flexibility with the language. And that was the feedback that I had heard from a couple other counselors. So I was going to add that language um, tonight. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's all I wanted. Great. Thank you both. Um, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Councillor Tibido, for bringing this forward. I know that we've had a conversation, but I have a couple of uh, uh, questions. Um, I think in terms of uh, how do we call it, are we asking employees to have face covering? Um, in terms of those who work in uh, grocery stores, are we asking the employees to buy the, uh, um, how do you call it themselves, the face covering, whatever that looks like? Or are we asking the employers to provide that? Uh, uh, and I know that Councillor Thibodeau said that he would look into uh, maybe uh, a second amendment next week. So I will be inclined in supporting this, knowing that uh, there might be a couple of uh, uh, um, languages and um, um, requirements that could be um, worked on uh, for when he brings back the amendment. So um, to, to the first question, yes. Um, uh, I would expect that an employer would provide the face covering, although I would just suggest the reason why I didn't um, include that specific language, one, because of the quick turnaround and date, but two, because the CDC on their websites actually outlined a broad range of materials that would work for such um, uh, face covering. That could be anything from an old t-shirt that you fold in a way with the two elastic bands, um, to a uh, to a uh, scarf to a uh, bandana. So there are a number of different um, uh, a number of different uh, materials that can be used. And I think if if we actually if we actually look forward um, and we are going to extend this or the governor makes some changes, I think uh, then we we can make a decision. But I think in the interim, I think the quickest way to get this implemented is by following the CDC's guidelines for the number of materials they provide and, and keep it broad. Thank you. Are you all set, Councillor Ali? Um, yes, thank you. And thank okay. you. Thank you. Councillor Ray. Thank you. Um, so I've been rather torn on this one and uh, had been going kind of back and forth on it a little bit for a while. And one thing that first occurred to me was that if we really felt that masks were necessary to protect the public um, and that it was most important for workers to be wearing them, the way that it's always described is that what a mask does is it protects other people. So it, I was having a hard time with the idea that we would force workers to wear them and give them no protection by also asking the public or you know, mandating the public to wear those. But I understand that's a very big, big ask. And so I see why Council to be okay with this. Um, and I appreciate that. But as I considered it more and more and more, I started to really look in to see if I could find um, what I would consider data that really supported the widespread use of cloth masks. And what I found was not um, data supporting the idea that this was something that should be mandated. I think I would be more comfortable with a recommendation than with a mandate. Um, and that's because when I look at the Center for Disease Control's website, while they are now recommending that people wear cloth coverings when they go into places where social distancing can't be achieved, the way that they're putting that on their website is that it's something that can be used, this is a quote, quote, can be used as an additional voluntary public health measure. So there's no suggestion for any mandates. The World Health Organization does not recommend face masks um, for the general public, only surgical masks for people who are symptomatic and for healthcare workers. Um, I looked at the 
Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy newsletter. And on April 1st, they published a commentary. So it's, a, it's an opinion piece, I will say that, but it is written by two doctors, a national expert on respiratory protection and infectious diseases, uh, and another also doctor expert on respiratory protection. And what they have said is that data is lacking to re recommend broad mask use. And a direct quote from this paper is, we do not recommend requiring the general public who do not have symptoms um, of COVID-19 like illness to routinely wear cloth or surgical masks because one, there is no scientific evidence they are effective in reducing the risk of transmission to their use may result in those wearing masks to relax other distancing efforts because they have a sense of protection. And three, um, we need to preserve the supply of surgical masks for at-risk health workers. And I know this is not recommending surgical masks, but what they go on to say is that if, if there's any kind of mask mandate, people are gonna seek the masks that they think are more effective. So they won't they won't just go for the cloth. If they feel like this is a mandate and they worry that people will then begin to eat other supplies if they can get them. I don't think they can even get them. Um, and then finally, there was a, this is a paper that came out, it was published in the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine on April 8th. Um, and they don't recommend masks because they say there haven't been sufficient studies on the effectiveness of cloth masks in preventing transmission of coronavirus to others. So it's impossible to assess their benefits. Uh, further on, they say that because aerosols likely play an important role in coronavirus transmission, cloth masks will do little, if anything, to limit spread of disease. Um, what? And that it could, it could prompt people to to relax the other standards that we know do work, the social distancing piece. Uh, so in looking at all of these, I stay, you know, I read all of this and I was still a little torn because I understand the um, I understand the aim. And I also understand the comments. I'm sure people saw the, the article in the paper by Ray Ruthier yesterday saying how torn people are on masks. And I, I can feel when I go out in public and I'm not wearing a mask and I'm 10 feet away from other people, I still get stares sometimes from people who are wearing masks because they feel that I'm not doing my duty. I feel that I'm doing my duty because I'm keeping the incredible social distance. When I go to Hannaford, I bring my bandana and I put it up if I'm going to be close to people, but I do it, I do it because I know it makes other people more comfortable. I don't do it because I believe it has efficacy. So I have a hard time supporting um, any kind of requirement. And I think I just want to, I'll leave it there and say that's where I am right now. And I'll listen to what other people say on this issue. Thank you, Councillor Ray. And um, uh, before we move on, I just want to um, say that uh, I was reminded that we need to take a roll call um, vote to extend anything that happens during a remote meeting. And Councillor Chong's hand is back up. So I would just like to be compliant in that and ask that we um, do a quick vote to extend time. Sorry, Kathy, but it feels like the right thing to do. So this is, this is, uh, this is just a um, extension of time uh, action taken by the council. Do I get the vote? Yeah, for whom? Just for Councillor Chong, or should we do for Councillor Dusan as well? If there's a request and Councillor Ray's time is over as well. well. That's why my hand is up to request the extension. Okay, so can we do a group extension if, if everybody requires more time? Because we've got three councillors who are currently out. I will see you. Yeah, Mayor, I'll just move that we um, suspend the rule. So oh. for everyone. Second. I, okay. I don't want to do six different row calls for every one of you. That's, that's okay, over. So we've got a motion to suspend the rules by Councillor Costa with a second by Councillor Cook. Can we do a roll call vote on that, please? 
Is that an extension? You extending the rule for three minutes or extending? Just, just well, I think we're just suspending our rules around time limits. Yeah. That's my intent. Okay. So do so. Hoping that people will yeah. be. Uh, Would you say, don't one? make me regret it? Uh, yes. <laughs> Council Mavadonis? Yes, with the hope that people um, limit comments. Council Cook? Yes. Council Ali? Yes. Council Costa? Yes. Council Ray? Yes. Council Thibodeau? Yes. Council Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we are. So we are um, back. I think Councilor Ray, you are. I think you completed um, your comments for that moment. Okay. So I'm going to go to Councilor Cook. I will uh, defer for the moment. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Uh, Councilor Chong. Um, I'm inclined to support this because we have. I think we need to have parity for acquiring all people to ride Metro buses to wear masks and only uh, essential, only non-essential business people who come in contact with the public to wear a mask. Um, I think that's, that's a reasonable um, ask for, uh, to, to make. And um, that's, that's where I'm landing. Thank you, Councilor Chong. Uh, Councilor Mavadonis. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I will support this. Um, I think there uh, is a lot of research about face coverings. Um, Councilor Ray is correct that the CDC guidelines are recommendations. Um, but, I, but I think this as, as uh, written makes some sense. Um, I will note for those listening that Metro is not part of the city of Portland. So it's a Metro board decision that, that they made and they're welcome to do that. Um, but I think uh, as this is, is, is written, um, it, uh, it requires people who are working with the public um, or public facing businesses um, to ensure that uh, uh, face coverings are used and they can be any type of, of uh, face covering. Um, I would have some concern if, if, if we, I think it would be a different discussion if we were talking about everybody in the community. Um, I think if uh, it is true, it's uh, getting face coverings right now. And I can tell you from experience and um, I've been lucky, I've bought uh, quite a number of them. Um, and if they're two to three weeks out, if you're gonna buy them generally from, from uh, a business that's making them. Um, but there are, I actually have one from um, uh, my neighbor who had several of them out in, in, uh, in a basket in front of their house that they had made for people. So it is possible to get them. I don't think it's a huge burden, um, but I think uh, it, it does make a lot of sense. It is true that the, the masks really um, uh, help you from, from spreading something if you're sick. Um, but I think you couple that with uh, physical distancing of at least six feet. And I am seeing more and more people every day um, wearing face coverings. Again, they're not required. People may philosophically think that they're unnecessary. Um, but I hate, you know, you look at some of the places on television now as they open up. I mean, people are, or people protesting are sometimes elbow to elbow mm -hmm. and not wearing any masks. And if any one of those folks happens to be uh, positive, um, a lot of people could be sick very quickly. So um, I think this is a, a prudent move um, at this time. And, and I appreciate Councillor Thibodeau bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dusan. I'll be uh, supporting this with enthusiasm and trepidation. Um, and uh, I actually think that we should also recommend that the general public wear masks or face coverings when they enter essential businesses like the supermarket. Um, but I'll save that amendment for next time. Um, 
would be a recommendation for the general public, and I very much support this amendment. Thank you, Councilor Dusan. Councilor Thibodeau. Oh, did you take your hand down? Okay, okay. So, um, Councilor Cook. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, I'd really like our own public health staff to provide uh, the council with guidance about the CDC recommendations. Um, my concerns have been, and I want to thank Councilor Thibodeau for bringing this forward because I think the issue of masks is uh, certainly, it's been on my mind as I go into stores um, and I have a mask on and see others without them. And, you know, so I think it is something that's very much out there. I am hoping that we uh, get some guidance from the governor, but I would like some guidance uh, from our public health uh, staff about what the federal and state CDC guidelines are for wearing masks, both for employees and for the general public uh, in, uh, in stores and in, in other public buildings uh, before I would be comfortable supporting this. I've been a little concerned that the amendment is um, overbroad in some respects and um, and too narrow in others. So overbroad in that it would apply to non-essential businesses. Uh, if a shop owner, for instance, was in their own shop uh, fulfilling orders that would be shipped by UPS and maybe not delivered days later that they might be required to wear a mask, uh, yet they're not within six, 10, 20 feet or days within another person. Uh, and yet um, in a retail setting, um, a customer could be well within six feet of an employee and not be required to wear a mask. So I would like a little more information about that. Uh, and because of the complexity of the issue and the fact that we're meeting next Monday, um, I would uh, like to move that we postpone this item until next week, uh, knowing that we might get some additional guidance from uh, the governor on this area, and also in hopes that we would hear back from our own um, Department of Health and Human Services, the Division of Public Health, regarding uh, the current recommendations uh, by those experts in uh, public health. So that would that would be my preference and my motion. Second. So oh, we've got a motion to postpone. Do we have a second? Second. Councilor Ray, um, we. I think we want to have some conversation about this motion. Um, I'm looking to Danielle for a little guidance here. Yeah, well, we, we go to council discussion with regard to the motion to postpone. Correct. And okay. um, I, Councilor Cook, was that, that was till uh, next Monday, you said? That's correct. Yeah, I think we meet next Monday, don't we? We yeah. do. Yeah. I was yeah. So I'm only looking, only looking to, for the minimum postponement just to get some uh, so, clarity. So May, for, May 4th, excuse May 4th. me. That's okay. correct. Okay, Thank so you. we've got a motion to postpone this amendment to our May 4th meeting. Um, is there any council comment or questions about that? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll weigh in just for a second. I, um, I, think, I think I'm ready to move on this. Um, but I also see that uh, given we we could we could move on this and we could revisit it next week with more information, knowing it's only a week away. Um, if it passes, uh, we could move on this um, in a variety of ways, um, up or down, and come back to it next week. Um, so I guess I, I'm just unclearly stating that I'm comfortable moving forward with it tonight, knowing that we we'll have a natural revisit in a week anyway, if we need more information or we wanna do some follow-up. Okay, so I'm gonna ask for a vote on the postponement, um, the motion to postpone till next Monday. Council Dusan. No. Council Mavadonis. No. Council Cook. Yes. Council Ali. No. Council Costa. Yes. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? No. Councilor Chong? No. Mayor Snyder? No. Our motion fails. Okay, so we are we are back at the amendment right now. Um, 
And I'm looking for any hands of counselors who wanna have their comment. Okay, so seeing no hands up at the moment, I, oh, Councillor Dusan. I may have missed it, but I recall that uh, Councillor Thibodeau spoke of adding something to it when he first introduced it, and I'm checking in to see if anything was added. Yep. Councillor Thibodeau, do you want to respond to that? Yes, I was just... Oh, my, am I on? No, I'm, I'm on, I'm on mute. I just yeah. sent um, so that everyone has it in their inbox, just the, the additional language. Um, it would just be an addition of the green language that you have. Um, so the, the amended language would say that notwithstanding any of the requirements before, an employee who does not interact with the public or can maintain a separation of at least six feet from another employee shall not be required to wear a face covering. Um, that would that was the additional language based on feedback from other counselors um, that I run that I ran by um, uh, corporation counsel's office earlier today. Okay. Point of order: It's after ten o'clock. Do we need to take a vote to continue deliberation? Mm -hmm. I think we do. Um, so yes. we'll pause here and. Second. Sorry, I'm getting conflicting looks. I'm gonna to look to Corporation Council and just confirm that we need to vote to continue. Yeah. Okay. So moved. Second. Uh, Councilor Dusan uh, moves to, to continue the meeting. Councilor Mavadonis seconds the motion and I'll look to the city clerk to call the roll for that vote. Yep. Um, Councilor uh, Dusan. I, I, I'm good. I asked my question. Thank you. Oh, no, wait. Right now, Where? Councilor Dusan, we're voting to continue the oh. meeting past 10. Yes. Okay. It's your motion. <laughs> Councilor Mavadonis? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? Yes. Councilor Ray? Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay. Now we're back. We're in amendment number seven and Councillor Thibodeau, I believe was uh, sharing the language um, that he emailed to all of us, which would amend the um, amendment that's in the packet. Councillor Thibodeau, do you have more to add at this time? I do not, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll second that amendment. Okay. So we've got, um, we've got an amendment to the amendment. Um, offered by Councillor Thibodeau, seconded by Councillor Costa. Do we wanna vote on that at this moment or do folks have comments about the green language? <laughs> I'm gonna call it the green language. I, uh, my hands up. Oh. Uh, Councillor Dusan. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut off Councillor Thibodeau. I was just pointing out the notion that my hand was up. Oh, okay. Councillor Thibodeau, do you wanna to speak to that? Um, I, I was I was just gonna add that I, in sending that off, I realized that it actually just says face coverings and does not say face masks. So to keep the language consistent, it'll, it should also say at the end of that green language, face covering or face mask. I okay. just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Councilor Dusan. My hand was in relation to that green language and that it says, uh, maintain a separation of at least six feet from another employee and i wondered if we intended that to be only employee or it or do we intend as the opening language says and other person i i think the the point was that if you're a public facing employee that you would have to uh, you would have to maintain that face covering it would only be that if you were had some sort of separation between you and another employee that you wouldn't, but I I struggled with that as well, and I don't know if Corporation Council wants to to lean in. I, I don't have your language in front of me, Council. I don't either. And so I was um I was trying to pull it up. I don't have it in front of me, so I didn't catch the question. I'm sorry. Hold on. We'll get back to that question, Councilor Dusan. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Does anybody else have any comments on the amendment to the amendment? I've got a couple hands up, but I'm not, I think those were up before we got into the green language. Okay, so no for Councillor Ray. Councillor Ali, does your, is your hand up to talk about the green language? Uh, I, I have a comment. I think I'm going to hold it until the green language has been cleared. <laughs> okay. So seeing no others, I'm back to Corporation Council if you've had a chance to look at that. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading it. I'm just unsure of what the question was. I didn't hear it. Councillor Thibodeau? I believe Councillor Dusan's question was where it says in, a, in the middle of the green language where it says can maintain a separation of at least six feet from another employee as to whether we should add another employee or person. And I think the answer to that question is yes. Um, but I just wanted to make sure. You I did. agree. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we would amend that to add the word person and, and, and the word mask toward the end of the green language. Yes. Okay. Um, any other, so uh, any, um, any additional comments on the proposed amendment to the amendment? So um, I have a question for Corporation Council. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I think Councillor Dilson did mention something that I've been struggling with, uh, which is that if we are asking uh, the staff at a grocery store or um, any uh, <clears throat> public facing um, um, entity to put on a mask, what about the public that is getting into the distance? Is it possible to add a language? I'm not saying that I'm going to force everyone to wear a mask or face covering, to add a language that says that uh, anybody who will be in, in any indoor space where we are asking staff to wear are recommended to also, uh, how do we call it up, uh, have some sort of like face covering. Uh, because um, uh, so far what I've seen online uh, shows some diagrams with uh, someone with uh, face covering and someone without. It shows that if both parties are wearing uh, face covering, irrespective of the distance between them, they are both to some extent protected. I, I, I don't know all the public health data and I would leave that to uh, more smart and capable people than I, but I think that the, um, I think we could do language like that. I think that Councillor Thibodeau and I had spoken about uh, language along those lines, um, but my understanding was what he's proposed tonight doesn't specifically include that, but um, at a later date, we could come back to that uh, since we'll be meeting on May 4th and go into that in more detail. Um, because I think one of the issues, of course, would be, I think with all of this language, it's going to be enforcement, but um, we could talk about whether or not it's a recommendation or we make it um, a mandate. Can I just add one other thing onto that answer as well? I think yes. there was also um, two things. One was the enforceability. The, se the second was allowing the public to comment on such an option. And when I was drafting that second amendment, um, we did not have it fully fleshed out and we didn't feel that there was enough time to actually put that amendment forward on the agenda because that's a big ticket item to have the greater public comment on it. And so if we were going to move in that direction based on what we hear tomorrow, that'd be something that we have the language prepared for. We could provide to the public to comment on. Um, and that's why we went, that's why I went this route as opposed to doing both amendments, but certainly there are two sides to this coin. This is not a silver bullet in any stretch of the imagination. Um, and this is one practice of a number that the CDC asks folks, folks to follow. Thank you. I've got a hand up from our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have made that request to city staff for a memo on uh, the CDC, both federal and state guidance on masks and retail locations and I'll have that probably tomorrow, uh, which I will forward to the city council. Thank you, city manager. So we are um, we are in the midst of this amendment. We're talking about amending the amendment. Um, and I think we're ready to go to a vote on the amendment to the amendment and then get back to the main um, amendment number seven as amended. So I'd like to ask the clerk to call um, the roll call vote for the Green Language Amendment. Council Dusan. I'm voting yes, as revised. Yes. Council Mavadonis. Yes. 
Council Cook? I'm voting yes as revised as revised. <laughs> right. <laughs> Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Costa? Yes. Council Ray? I'm voting like Kim Cook voted. Yes. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Council Chong? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay. So we have unanimous approval of additional language, a change to the original Amendment 7 offered by Councillor Thibodeau. So Councillor Thibodeau's original Amendment number 7 has now been altered slightly with green language, um, which will be made available. And so now we are back at the amendment from Councillor Thibodeau as amended. And I'm looking for discussion on that item. Councillor Thibodeau. I was just going to provide just a summation so that we could just keep it as clear as humanly possible and, and to give folks and the public an idea of what this actually practically means for them. And that if you are a public facing employee that you would have to wear a mask. Uh, if you are an employee who can maintain um, a social distance um, of six feet from either another employee or person, um, you are not required to wear a face covering or mask. And um, I'll just leave it at that and as simple as, as humanly possible. Thank you, Councilor Thibodeau. Councilor Costa. Um, thank you, Mayor. So uh, I'm very torn on this uh, and have been. Um, I, I'm going to vote no tonight, even though I uh, am generally supportive of this, uh, because I, I think that um, for me, just one of the lessons we've learned uh, in the past several weeks is that it's very important that we get, uh, that we have the ability to communicate effectively to the public, because at the end of the day, we don't want a, a paper plan for fighting the pandemic. We need this to be implemented, um, to be actionable. And in order for people to do that, I think we have to uh, communicate that as clearly as is humanly possible. So uh, while I, you know, uh, am very sympathetic to moving in this direction, I, I worry that uh, what we've done so far is going to lead to greater confusion in the community about who, uh, what precisely um, is going to be required in terms of the face covering. Um, who's responsible for providing it and which employees uh, do that. Um, now, that's not a criticism of the language that has now been drafted to address that, uh, but I think passing this uh, now as we approach 10.30 uh, to implement in a few days time, I, I think is more likely than not to lead to confusion. And I think it would be a wiser move uh, to come back to this uh, at a later time, uh, if not our next meeting, uh, then a meeting after that, um, when we have more information and we have a more, uh, we have had more opportunity to communicate effectively with the public in advance of uh, taking such an action. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mavidonis. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm still uh, supportive of this and supportive of taking this action tonight. I think where there's been confusion has been something that we've passed and either we did not communicate it clearly after we passed it or we thought we had and, and some didn't understand it. I think this is pretty straightforward and I think it doesn't go into effect tomorrow. Um, there is sufficient time for staff to communicate this to the public. And we, we've, we've, uh, we've lessened things considerably this evening in a lot of ways. And this is perhaps a slight tightening up. Um, however, I think as we're looking to balance that, those health needs versus those economic needs, um, I think this is a sensible and prudent approach. And, you know, there are, you know, or intricacies may not be the right word, but, you know, when it comes to face coverings, it depends what it's made of. 
I don't think we're mandating that you have to have a certain thickness of cloth. Um, we're saying you have to use the CDC guidance, which is a face covering, which could be any variety of things. There's more protection if you wear a thicker or a different material than if you wear a thinner one. Um, but you know, this actually has had a fair amount of, of publicity um, since it was proposed last week. Um, you know, I, I can't read into whether people have been paying attention or not, but certainly the businesses that have been uh, interested in the issues that were before us tonight that have been flagged uh, would have had a really hard time missing the, the publicity or the, the uh, uh, amendment that was put in the backup information if they were following it. So um, I don't think we should punt on this. I think if we wanna revise this uh, in the future, um, we can do that. Um, I think if I understand this correctly and, and Councillor, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Thibodeau, but uh, I think of a, I'm not trying to single out a business, but I think of a, a grocery store. If I'm, if I'm working in a grocery store as an employee in any capacity, um, I think what I understand is I have to have on a mask. If I'm working, uh, and tell me if this is uh, a misunderstanding, if the store is closed and there are just employees working in their stocking shelves and they're not physical distance or they're physical distancing in a way that it is more than six feet from each other, then I'm not sure they have to have that mask on. Um, but I think if you're facing the public, whether it's in a grocery store or a store that is dealing with fabric or shoes, if you're inside the building, it's, it's, it may be handled differently depending on how many people are there versus if you are bringing something out to the delivery person or uh, the city councilor who shows up at the, at the door to buy a, a, a piece of, uh, a, a product. I, I think that's the way I understand this and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, there may be other, other uh, unique features of it. But, um, so I'm, I'm very supportive of this. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thibodeau. I was just going to ask um, to Councillor Costa's point, just to have Corporation Council um, put together the guidance. That's why I wanted to give a little bit of lag time to this, not only for for folks to create their own face mask, which can be done within a minute's time. If you actually go to the CDC's website, they have a YouTube video that shows you how to do it um, with a number of different different materials, um, uh, so that we can get that up and online tomorrow. Um, and then just the last piece I'd, I'd say is this proposal literally codifies everything we have all been practicing. You can't maintain that six feet of distance. You should be wearing a face covering. Um, and um, that is, that's the guidance that we've, most of us have been operating on. And I think to Councilor Cook's point, to Councilor Ray's point about, uh, and Councilor Ali's point about our statement to the public is, look, if you are, if you cannot maintain that distance, you should be wearing a face covering, even if you're not working in the store. If you're, if you're just a patron in a grocery store, you should be wearing that face covering because the point is my face covering protects you, yours protects me. And so we, as a group, we are, we, we are together protecting one another. And so um, this is a first step. And I think next week, um, provided we get some guidance tomorrow, I think we might be ready for the second step. But I am curious to see um, how, how this impacts um, the practice that most of us are following today. Thank you, Councillor Thibodeau. Uh, Councillor Ray. So just two things quickly. I still don't plan to support this tonight. It's possible that if I hear guidance from the governor or from um, other places that, that I could support it in the future, I, I will obviously follow it and in um, support of workers that are going to be mandated to wear a mask, I will, I will also wear the mask. Um, and I would also say that Matthew McConaughey has an excellent YouTube video about making a mask. And if you want to be entertained while learning how to make a mask, that's the one to go to. All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Councillor Ray. Um, I'm going to chime in here on this particular amendment. Um, uh, to, to all of you who brought amendments forward this evening, um, thank you. Uh, thank you to Councillor Thibodeau for this one. Um, I've been generally supportive from the beginning when, when Councillor Thibodeau reached out to me late last week. Um, and I've been getting constituent emails and I've been doing my own reading and I've been talking to some of you and I've tried to kind of balance my thoughts over the course of the weekend uh, and even today. And I knew that I would be interested in hearing discussion tonight. So I'm glad that we've had a good one. Um, I also reached out to Portland by local today and the chamber because I was interested to know what they thought of this proposed amendment. And um, especially with the inclusion of the green language, um, my sense is that both are supportive of this amendment. Um, a couple other things that I just wanna say is that for me, part of the context here and with so many other things that we're talking about these days is this is within the context of our emergency order, which has expiration points. And it gives me comfort to be able to say, we're doing certain things under the context of our emergency order and we can revisit it. And we can look to the governor for guidance when that guidance comes, if it comes in this direction. Um, so that, that makes me feel um, kind of like I have a, I, I'm working within um, or under an umbrella that's different than maybe a typical city ordinance. Um, so considerations within our emergency order um, just, just have, they play a different role for me. And so I think about this one in terms of our emergency order and how we're progressing down the path as I discussed earlier. And I do think that um, having public facing employees at essential businesses wearing face coverings is something that makes sense. Um, I think of employee to employee safety, which people do reach out to us about. And I think that's a factor that we've got to consider. I do think it's important for employers to provide um, the masks if possible, or at least to give guidance to their employees about how to do it quite simply. We're not really looking to make anybody's life more difficult than it already is. We actually just wanna keep people healthy while we transition into um, next stages of this work. And so I'm thinking about that as well. Um, uh, we talk about it, some of the literature that I've gone to talks about exposure zones. And this is really what we're talking about is when you're in an exposure zone, um, there's a benefit to having a mask on yourself and to having those other people have masks on. Um, as we've all said tonight, the, the sort of personal responsibility that we take on in terms of wearing our own mask to some extent, you know, it resides with us. Um, but feeling comfort that I'm gonna go into Hannaford, for example, and that I'm gonna be covered and they're gonna be covered um, there's, I think there's something there that gives folks comfort. Um, I was on a call, I mentioned it earlier today, a Zoom meeting with GP Cog folks and a sentiment was raised, which I thought is, uh, I think is relevant here, which is sometimes it's about perception of safety. We don't know exactly um, all of the factors that fall within this, uh, this category, um, but we, we do have perceptions of safety and um, we're, we're all thinking about what I'm doing and what you're doing. And so this falls under uh, that category to me um, in terms of how are we behaving and is it responsible to ourselves and to each other. Um, the last thing that I'll say about this in this moment is that it's due, to, do you mind calling the roll for this vote, please? So we're voting on number amendment seven as amended. Correct. So Councillor, let me go to this one. Yes. Yes. Tucson. Councilor <laughs> Madonis? Yes. Councilor Cook? No. Councilor Ali? No. Councilor Costa? No. Councilor Ray? No. Councilor Thibodeau? Yes. Councilor Chong? Yes. And Mayor Snyder? Yes. Five to four. Motion passes. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you everybody for really, really thoughtful conversation. Um, and given that we will be seeing each other a week from tonight, we will continue. Um, Mayor, we have, to, we have to vote on the main motion as amended. So. Oh yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did that last time too, ready to move. Okay, so we are back at the main motion.